Hello, hi, welcome, welcome to AAD825 Twin Motion Edition. In this course, I'm going to teach you everything that I know about Twin Motion and how to achieve the best possible results and get the best possible architectural renders as well as architectural animations, right? And it's going to be a single video. I'm not doing the three part series anymore. Uh, everything's going to be condensed into a single video. And hopefully, if I remember, it's going to be separated into chapters. If I remember to do that, that the chapters are going to be now displayed on the screen. Good, I remembered. <laughs> anyway, let, let's move on. So before we begin, let's talk about software. Chapter one, what you will need or what, what you need, right? So of course you will need a 3D model and my modeling software of choice, as well as most of the schools these days, modeling of choice is either Revit or Rhino. Revit is very straightforward with importing geometry into Twinmotion, but at the same time, it's, it lacks a lot of flexibility that Rhino has to offer, right? With Revit, you usually can't make minor adjustments to the geometry or to the way the materials wrap around and so on. With, uh, with, with Rhino, you can. With that being said, both of them use the same, well, not the same uh, exactly plugin, but a same name of the plugin, and that's called Data Smith. If you just go to twinmotion.com uh, slash NUS slash plugins, I'll leave a link in the video description. If you just uh, straight up go to this uh, website, then you can just download the Data Smith exporter for Rhino. That's of course, if you're on your personal computers. If you're working on a computer, for instance, at a school, right? The, it's, it's already there, it's already installed. Right, so you don't need to do that. So that's for Rhino. Revit has exactly the same uh, data smith exporter. So uh, if, if you have it installed in, in Revit, then it's just a single click to get your files into Twinmotion. In this case, download it, install it, restart Rhino, and then you will see this menu box right here. And let me maximize this so that it's, it's clear what I'm talking about. You will see this menu box right here, data smith with synchronize, uh, toggle auto synchronization, connections, export, 3D view and messages, basically a log of information that it gives you, right? This is going to be an interface that is going to fetch your 3D model and put it in another software, which is going to be twin motion in this case. It also deals with Unreal Engine, but um, let's, let's just focus on twin motion in this course, right? So what what now you have is you have the model and you have the link by the way the model is available uh, to download either through the course website or through canvas page or i'll put a link in the video description it's not going to be this exact model right but it's going to be a very similar at least a model that has very similar layer hierarchy and a very similar level of detail inside of it right so you should be able to follow along just by following with the model that you have downloaded, but preferably you have your own model that you can use to, you know, um, kill uh, two birds with one shot or whatever it's called. Not, not an English speaker. Anyway, so you have the plugin, you have the model. Now it's time to actually open up Twinmotion and get the model into Twinmotion, right? So the way you do it is if you're on your own computer, you just start Epic Games, Epi, uh, you create an ep, not create, sorry, you start an Epic Games launcher, you go to the Unreal Engine tab, to Twin Motion tab, because Twin Motion runs on Unreal Engine, it's weird, I know, but trust me. And then you hit launch, right? By, by also, don't forget to select the correct version, right? The newest version is always the correct version. <laughs> and just hit launch. Those of you who work uh, from the either office computers or school computers, you will most likely not be able to run Epic Games browser. Instead, you will need to go to the start menu and here you would type in twin motion. Um, this is my personal computer, so I don't, don't have it here, but most of the time the IT department tends to just give you a link to, to twin motion here uh, from the start menu, right? So once that is done, you load up twin motion, right? And you're presented with uh, some, you know, news, community highlights, spotlights, and, and so on. You don't care about those. You, all you care about is creating a new scene, right? 
There's also different templates for rendering. Or you can open, of, of course, an old project this way as well. But there's uh, also templates for rendering different things. But since we're doing architectural rendering, we are just straight up creating a new scene, right? So I'll click on that. There we go. So once this scene is loaded in, you can see that actually, well, there's already stuff here, right? So let, let me guide you through this. So I guess uh, it's time for chapter two, chapter two. All right, chapter two. So let's talk about user interface and generally what, what do you see here, right? When you open up Twinmotion. So I think we start with the bottom line here, right? The import materials, populate, media, and export. These five, not tools, but like workflows are what en encapsulates our workflow that we're going to be doing in this course. We will be importing the geometry. We will be adding materials to the geometry. We will be populating the surrounding environment as well as the inside with assets, meaning trees for, for the outside, rocks and whatnot, and for the inside, like books and so on. Right. Then we will be creating our views. So cameras in the environment um, from, from different angles, uh, perhaps also animating them. And then we will be exporting them, meaning we will be rendering them out. So this encapsulates it very well. And if I click on import, that's the first thing that, you know, we should do. So I could show you everything, you know, about the user interface with this, uh, starting scene right here that, that, that you see, you know, a little sphere on the pedestal and so on. But I think it's nicer to do it with the model that we have, right? So that's, that's what we're going to be doing. With that being said, just some basics, right? So, so that we're on the same page. If you click and hold the right mouse button, you can look around, W to move forward, click and hold the mouse button, right mouse button, W move forward. S to move backwards, A to move left, D to move right, WSD, video game type of movement, very, very convenient. Then Q, I'm still holding the right on mouse button, by the way, Q lifts us up, E puts us down, right? So Q, E to go up or down, and you can just kind of fly, fly around this way. Um, how do I explain this? So in CAD and any kind of CAD modeling software, and let me just put this guy right here maybe, in any of CAD modeling softwares, uh, the right mouse button to orbit, shift right mouse button to pan the view, uh, scroll wheel to zoom in, zoom out. That is very, very convenient when you're doing pr uh, product or object modeling, right? When you're rotating around an object, and you're changing things, you know, you're, you're changing geometry. That's super, a super convenient way of how to navigate. When you need to go into the space and you need to move, you know, down the stairwell and then turn left. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm outside of the building now. Uh, and then turn left, it becomes very clunky, very fast and very horrible to use. So for architectural visualization purposes, WASD movement is great, right? For spatial, spatial movement, spatial exploration. That's exactly why video games use it, right? Because it's the ideal way. You'll get used to it, is what I'm saying, right? So with that out of the way, we're, we're able now to navigate in, on, on the, in, in our scene. We also have uh, the numbers one, two, three, four, five, or six. Those are speeds. So if I choose the number one, I'm very slow. I am moving, I'm just moving very slow, right? If I'm using number three, you know, we're, we're flying through, not not that fast, but kind of, kind of flying. And then six is just, we're zooming about. By the way, if you accidentally just kind of navigate yourself out of existence and you have no idea where you are right now, um, we, what you need to do is find a piece of geometry and zoom into it. And the way you do it is, well, if you don't see anything that you could zoom into uh, on your screen, then you need to look at the top right hand side menu 
here, menu box here, which lists every single piece of geometry, and don't forget to expand uh, to see more, uh, every single piece of geometry that you have currently in the scene, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the sphere, one mirror, and press F, F key, to focus on or to zoom in to the sphere, right? Oh, I accidentally messed it up again. F, and don't forget to change the speed to like three or something. Now we're back, right? We're back to, to our little scene here. There's also ways of how you can change like lighting and so on, but we will not be dealing with those. Okay. And I stop here with the user interface because I want to import our file to continue talking about UI with the file that we have. So, because it's going to be more, more interesting than just having a sphere here. So I'm going to control A, control A to select everything. Or you can just, oops, sorry about that. There we go. Or you can just shift select everything here and hit delete. Just delete everything. Don't need it. That's a starting scene, don't need it. Okay. Then under import, I will click this little plus sign to import stuff. And here you have the possibility to either import geometry Right, so that's the that that would be your separate uh, like files, uh, separate separate uh, meshes or separate object files. We will not be doing that. We'll what we will be using is a direct link. Okay, I need to tell you this. I hate the direct link. I think it's some it's sometimes buggy and does not work the way I would like it to work, but it is the preferred method of, of using a bridge between Rhino and Twinmotion. Thus, I'm going to teach you the proper way of, of how to do it. I personally export static, static files and import them statically without any kind of a direct linking shenanigans. With that being said, the direct link is the industry standard and I'm teaching you industry standards, so we use that, right? Here, uh, direct link setting source, you can see that uh, in my case, I have Rhino 7 and Rhino 8 opened up. So it's, it tells me that there's multiple sources. If I click on these three little dots here, it tells me, you know, there's, there's like two files that you have, which one do you want, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just select my, my file, you know, to a motion course RH7 in this case, uh, Rhino 7, this file right here. And I'll just simply click on the synchronize bu button. Synchronize with direct link. Bam. It writes the information. It sends the information. Now, if I go back to Twinmotion and I click on my Rhino Twinmotion course, Rhino 7, right here, it gives me all of the options that it wrote. Well, not wrote, but how it can read the file that that's writ being written. And do we need to change anything here? Let me just quickly check. Full precision normals. Hmm, that sounds good. Let's tick full precision normals. I have absolutely zero idea of what is a not full precision normal. Every normal should be full precision. Normal is the 90 degree vector sticking out from any, any surface, right? So basically uh, information of at which direction is the surface looking at. It should be precise. Anyway, process, uh, all, sure, light settings, use original, sure, enable substitution, uh, don't enable substitution. You don't need to do this portion at all. This is useful when you are uh, substituting multiple entities of placeholder elements with some, some custom made elements that you will have. It's, it's an advanced technique. You don't need it. Um, very, very niche. Okay. Let's just import. I'm blabbing too much. Okay. We have this uh, now file imported. Let me just move around, around it. See, see what's up. Seems good to me. Seems good to me. A little bit wavy, but that's fine. Okay, and everything is white. And the reason why everything is white is because it's um, in, in Rhino. If I were to look at the rendered view, well, it's gray. Okay, sure. But if I look at the materials, there's no materials, right, associated with this geometry. 
right? Meaning that uh, to in motion just assumes that okay everything is just base base white color, right? That's the way it operates. So what we will need to do is kind of make a few adjustments here. So the DataSmith export or the DataSmith direct link is actually a um, real time link, meaning that if I now go and oh, let's do it this way, pum pum. If I do something like, let's move into this. Uh, by the way, if like it becomes too cramped, you can always click on this library icon right here to minimize it. And you can also click on this scene and properties icons, the blue ones to hide them so that you can see the, you know, more, more of the view here. Right. So for example, if I were to take this top hat of the building, which is in architect's terms called a roof, <laughs> if I were to take it and just move it up, right? This does not update, but if I then click on the synchronize button, Voila, the roof is lifted, right? I keep pressing the, uh, by the way, the R button, R, uh, turns on the rendering, the, not the preview, but the actual rendering of the scene. So if you see any noise, that's because you press the R button for rendering. Press it again and then you're back to, back to normal, right? And the way this works is actually pretty interesting. You can see that the inside of the geometry is transparent while the outside is not and this is because <coughs> this particular piece of geometry does not have thickness meaning that the outside and the inside of it um, are um, so so sorry basically it means that uh, since it does not have any thickness the outside gets shaded while the inside of it does not get a shading model for uh, calculated for it thus becoming op opaque not opaque transparent opposite of opaque right so to fix that uh, you can actually change the material settings and i'll show you how to well actually right now let, let's do it so for that we need to go to properties right here also enable scene uh, bottom right corner, both scene and properties enabled. Notice how the scene has so many objects here. I will talk about those in just a second, but um, all of the objects that we currently have are listed in the scene. That, that's an important thing to understand. Then I take this pipette tool from the top and I click on my little roof uh, geometry right here. And that gives me the settings for the material for which I can change um, different, you know, uh, options, sorry, uh, different options of it. And I believe um, under miscellaneous, misc option, there's the two-sided material option, right? So if I now look at from underneath of it and I click on the two-sided option, now it is generated properly, right? Or it's, it's rather shaded, uh, shaded properly. Um, also, if I untick two-sided and I just go down here, you can see that the whole landscape is also a perfectly thin piece. So I can, you know, shade it this way as well. Please note that the way the light is calculated on the backside of the geometry is just very bad and you should not, you know, overuse this. So two-sided needs to be used with very, very you know, light hand, right? With that being said, there's like more, more options, of course, here that, that you can do. Uh, let me just go back to Rhino, Control Z to move back the, the roof and synchronize again so that the roof is back here. And in terms of the materials, for example, we can change the color of the material. For now, let's just do that, right? We'll have a completely separate chapter for materials, right? So you can make it pink, blue, whatever color you want, right? I'm just going to not have it clear all. Uh, oh, sorry, clear all does not matter. Um, 255. If you want pure white, you just do 255, 255, 255, or the hex code for uh, pure white is FFFFF. FFFFFF, six Fs. 
right? And you can just drop down the luminance of it to be a little bit less, less white, right? Um, a little bit less bright. So that's that's our, our for, for now, that's the materials and how you can pick out a material of your scene and then adjust it. Notice how when I change the material here, let me change something else real quick, metallic, right? When I change the material, everything changes in the scene. And that is because all of this geometry currently is tied to a single piece of material. That is a no-no. That's that's bad. So what we what you always need to do during the import is have different materials planned out that you will have in the scene and have them separated out in, in separate layers. In Revit, you don't really need to do that. Uh, Revit kind of takes care of it automatically. But the problem with Revit is how then if you want to readjust something and, and kind of do minor, you know, changes, then Revit just goes like, no, I, I took care of it. It is what it is. You, you, you need to, you know, use this specific material on this wall um, as well as this wall and not, nothing else, right? So Rhino is very nice in terms of flexibility, but of course, flexibility equals always more work, right? Because it can't be automated as much. Which brings us to the Rhino files layer system. The way I layer things is, for instance, in Windows, I have my glass, which is a separate layer. And I have my frames, which is a separate layer. And I know that my glass will have its own material and my frames will have its own material. I have a roof. And for the roof, I have the exterior shell of the roof. And I have the interior shell, right, of, of the roof. Because I want this interior shell to be probably white, you know, stucco material, while the exterior shell, I will aim for maybe metal, maybe cladded metal, something like that, right? Same thing with this facade right here. If I look at the walls, I have my exterior facade, this. Oh, by the way, notice how, let me create a clipping plane. And, and just kind of zoom in here. Don't look at that. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Uh, but basically, I have this interior wall, technically. I will have this as a white or maybe concrete material. But then I have this cladding around the perimeter, the exterior perimeter around the facade. That's going to also be metal or something like that. So I'm wrapping around with... Uh, you know, specific geometry to, to drive the material. Same thing here. If I move this away, you can see that there is uh, just a box, almost a box underneath, but it's wrapped around with a material that, that you know, has thickness and that, that I'm going to adjust. I feel like this is the cleanest way of how you can do it and uh, everyone should do it, right? So all of my layers that I have here I can't stress this enough, this is a very, very important notion, are separated out, the geometry is separated out into layers according to what kind of material that geometry will have to have. So you can't have wood and wood stairs and metal railing of the same stairs in the same layer because in twin motion everything is going to be read as a single material from that layer right so you need to have them in, in separate layers one for wood one for metal hope okay this should be clear if it's not clear well then that means i failed but also ro roll it back watch it again should be clear <laughs> okay so with that being said uh, i have all of these layers right, separated out, but still, in twin motion, everything has a single material. What gives? Well, that's because while the layers are separate, the geometry, or sorry, the materials associated with the layers are completely, like, everything is the same material, right? You can see here, let me expand this, you can see here, all of the materials here are exactly the same, same material, right? Just white. And that's why everything has the same material in twin motion. So 
A way of how you can create a material one material per layer is by using a very neat command important. Listen. Synchronize. Synchronize. Render colors. Sy synchronize render colors. Enter. I wrote it wrong. <laughs> synchronize. Synchro so dramatic. Synchronized render colors. Click. Choose all layers. And then it creates a custom material for each layer with that particular color. Right? Now if I go to my rendered view, it's not gray anymore. Right? If I click on synchronize, by the way, you can auto synchronize, but I don't suggest you do so. Uh, I suggest um, doing the manual synchronization between uh, Twin Motion and Revit, uh, Rhino, right? So back in Twin Motion, hello, what? Wait a minute. Oh no, did I mess it up? Okay, synchronize again. Now that's weird. Okay, let's escape out. Apologies, give me a second. All right, I know what, what happened. I know exactly what happened. So remember when we messed around with the material, right? Basically, the moment you mess around the material, it gets overwritten, so it takes over, and all of the material changes that you do in Rhino don't matter anymore because now Twin Motion Material Editor is taking over. So when we were changing the brightness values and so on of the Rhino model, well, sorry, of, of, of the within the Twin Motion of the Twin Motion model, um, we were overwriting any influence from Rhino to change the materials. So what I did was Control A, delete, and then re-import deleted objects. So here under import Rhino, the three little dots re-import deleted objects, and it just worked. If it still doesn't work for you, you can just uh, select this, delete the import altogether, Control A, delete the, everything in the scene, click the little plus sign, choose the correct one and re-import everything. And then it's gonna work for sure, right? Okay, so I kind of I think it's good. It's it's good that I show it, so I'll keep it. Usually I cut out my mistakes, but this one I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it in. Right. So now you can see that all of our objects have separate uh, separate materials associated with them, and I think that's going to be enough to produce a pretty good image. Uh, this area might be a little bit boring. We'll see. But it, it should be, should should be pretty close to, you know, looking good. Right now it doesn't, let's just be, be clear. Right now it doesn't look good. So let's go back to the scene, right? So in terms of importing, I, I think now you probably get it, how, how it kind of works. If I click these three little dots, you can um, res reset different kind of either transformations, transformations means move, rotate, scale. So if I take this and I just kind of move it around and moved it away and whoops, no, 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 no. I, then I can just click on this, these three little dots and reset transform on selection. Oh, don't forget to select the object, reset transform, bam, snaps back in place where, where it needs to be, right? So that's one thing. Second thing is reset materials on selection. Oh could have done, done that. For that, we would need to select all of the, the whole scene, control A, and then just reset materials on selection. That would work as well with our issue that the material wouldn't update, right? And besides that, yeah, so, uh, reset properties, but we don't really have many, many properties associated with this, so we don't care. Okay, with that done, now let's continue talking about the scene here. So these are all of the different B reps and files and materials and so on that, that we have, right, in, in our our scene. Every time you select something, it, it gets highlighted here. You can hide it here as well, of course, right? But also uh, on the right-hand side, there is this, the menu that, that, that you have of what you can do 
with the material, right? And uh, sorry, with the object, right? And I will not uh, go through every single um, option, every single option here, but I'm going to um, showcase the most important one that is the isolate on or off. By the way, you all, all, all you know, all understand what rename and delete does, right? And replace object, what that would do. Uh, isolate and zoom to selection. These two are the most useful for me. Um, and for isolate, I don't know the keystroke, so I always just do this, right? And now you're operating only with that object. You're working only with that object. Then I can select it again, off, and now we're back to normal. So it's like hiding everything. Very, very useful when you just need to focus in on texturing and so on, on the material of that particular object without having a crap ton of stuff in, in your scene lagging out your computer. Okay, so that's your scene graph, right? All right, let's talk about UV mapping. By the way, I'm in materials section right now. We're done with the import section. We move on to material section, which shows us all of the materials that are used in the scene. Ignore the aluminum, <laughs> but it shows all of the materials that are used in the scene. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. More importantly, UV mapping. So UV mapping deals with how textures style on top of your geometry, right? Meaning that if you have a solid color, it doesn't matter. Uh, it can be whatever uh, way you slap on the color. It, you know, it's, it's a solid color. No one will know. No one will see. But the moment you start adding details, you know, like a image, then the image, let's see, an image of a dragon. The dragon can be horizontal on here. It can be vertical on here. It can be cl clipped on this corner. It can be clipped on this co corner. It can be stretched and, and so on, right? So there's different ways of how you can position an image or wrap an image around your geometry. The way the computer does it, it unfolds the geometry onto a flat piece of, well, not paper, but like on, on, on ground, unfolds the geometry, maps the texture onto the geometry and folds it back. That is called custom UV unwrapping. Unwrapping is the important word here. In architecture, most of the stuff that we do are boxes, boo, but it's true. <laughs> and for that, we have optimized tools that deal with this very, very quickly and very easily, right? And I'll show you that uh, on the Rhino side as well. But in certain cases, you need to use custom UV unwrap. For, examples, uh, for example, one of those cases is going to be our roof. If I now turn on the library here, bottom left, go to materials, go to metal and scroll, 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 scroll until I see, uh, is there like anything nice here? Give me a second. Really? No panels? Well, there's aluminum panels, but they're like blue. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm going to use blue aluminum. Oh, there's black ones. Okay. Aluminum panels right and i just drag and drop them in drag and drop them onto your roof or whatever geometry you have that is a little bit more custom uh, you'll see that the tiling of it is a little bit weird and like the rotation of it is a little bit weird and it's it's it doesn't fit right so of course by the way when you drag and drop you immediately get access to the settings of it so here under uv i can change the rotation of my texture which is gnarly and also i can change the scale of the texture so i can make it smaller even smaller 0 0.01 uh, 0 0.05 maybe yeah something like that right so now the scale is kind of correct but unfortunately the tiling especially for this bottom one is just no absolutely not right and if i were to rotate my texture right now uh, 90 degrees you'll see that the tiling now here just completely breaks this means that uv mapping of this particular also this does not line up yucky very very yucky uh, this means that we need to use custom tiling for this for everything else we'll use uh, much much easier tools but 
for now that that's what we're gonna do. So back in Rhino, Rhino 7, I will show you on Rhino 8 as well. Uh, so this, this chapter will have like two parts. In one part I show the Rhino 7 workflow and the second part I show Rhino 8 workflow. Rhino 8 is much better at custom UV unwrapping than Rhino 7. So I want to show, show it as well. But first we will begin with Rhino 7. In Rhino, I select my geometries that I'm going to unwrap. I'll start with this bottom one, right? And I'll isolate, isolate it. There we go. This little ring right here. I'll click on the properties option of it. Oops, I select it and click on properties, right? Expand that. And here under properties, I have the texture mapping slot. I click on that and select the last item in this tool list right here called UV editor. You can also type in UV editor, UV editor. It's going to ask you to draw a rectangle. So for that, I'll use the top view and I'm just going to draw a rectangle somewhere close by to my object like that. Um, and you'll see more likely something like this. There we go, right? So now what you see here is your object and how it's being unfolded onto a flat piece of ground or a, a flat texture, right? So for, uh, for us to actually see much better, uh, we will not use, and by the way, you also get this menu with the UV, UV editor menu. Uh, I'm, I'm going to not use the material because it's a solid color. I'm going to use the texture. And now you can see how the texture tiles on this geometry and how it just breaks completely. So what I want is I want a consistent flow of the edges. And for that, I will of course show wireframe if you don't don't have it yet, do. And then I'm going to, well, actually this is gonna get in the way. So I'm going to cancel uh, the UV editor. And what I'm going to do is unwrap, unfold this geometry, right? For that, you select it, you click on unwrap button right here, or you type in unwrap, unwrap, like Christmas present. It's going to ask you to select seams. Seams are where the algorithm is allowed to cut to be able to unfold the geometry, right? Because if you don't give it any seams, it's, you know, it, a solid piece of geometry cannot be unfolded if there's zero cuts in it. Try unfolding a basketball, right? You need to cut it multiple times to be able to unfold it. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Select seams. Uh, we basically select the edges that we are okay with it cutting to unfold. And you can see, I just selected the top perimeter here because I'm okay with this being separated completely from the interior of it. I actually won't care as much about the interior. I only care about the exterior. So I'm being very, very kind of focused on preserving. There we go. The, the integrity only of the exterior here. Okay, this should be fine, like that. And then for this rectangle, rectangular ring to unfold, I will say that cuts can be made here, here. So this flap just folds out here and here. So it just kind of plop, folds out and separates into, actually it's going to separate into like four different pieces. Am I okay with that? I'm actually, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. And just to be kind of clean about it, I'm, I'm gonna also do the same thing for the exterior, oh, sorry, interior of it. But this one doesn't, doesn't matter as much, so I'm just gonna, yeah, ignore it, you know, if it, if it doesn't work out. Okay, with that done, hit enter, it unfolds. Then I do the UV editor thing again to actually see how it tiles. And you can see that, you know, while, while it is tiling uh, now, like, sorry, while it is unfolding now properly, the tiling of it is just, why? 
why is this kind of being rotated weird and so on and that's because my geometry itself is rotated according to world x y coordinates so it's not aligned with world x y coordinates that's fine uh, you're able to move these guys around to actually you know, I, I align them. So for instance, this one, let's see which one it is the, here, right? I can just select this and I can rotate from here to here and then snap to the horizontal direction. And now everything aligns perfectly here. So you can, you know, align nicely. We will do this later because I have a second piece that I also need to unwrap and then we will align both of those pieces together, right? So, so that's, very kind of clean um you, you'll, you'll see what i mean so this is um it has four pieces here that are flat uh, this area right here that is just a rectangle and the interior space that we really don't care about as much yeah we're fine yeah yeah okay so we're, we're gucci with this actually maybe not uh, there's one thing that I want to adjust, and that is the unfolding, the, the way it unfolds. So I'm going to cancel this, actually. I'm going to select this object again. I'll unwrap again, but this time I'll choose previous seam selection option so that it shows me what I have selected last time. And I will actually unselect the outer perimeter, and I will select the inner top perimeter. I think that's going to leave a nicer connection um, between like the, this seam. The seam will be kind of nicely bent. At least that's that's my my hope. Or actually, no, no. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to separate the top one completely from the bottom ones. Okay, enter. We're good with that. Sorry, I, I will move on quicker. So now I will show selected uh, this uh, object right here. I will immediately unwrap it because it's the same same procedure, right? Uh, so I just select this triangle needs to be separated out the surface, this triangle separated out and the surface as it folds. Yeah, something like that, like that. And then the bottom perimeter right here. Everything else uh, is going to be on the inside. I don't care about anything else in there. Should be good. Okay, enter. So that's done. I will. I can now select both of them and just use UV editor to see how they how they behave. And you can see that while the size is kind of similar, you know. The, the way it fits is kind of similar. It's not really perfectly one to one. Uh, this would especially be visible if you had objects that are comp two objects that are completely different in size. The small one would have tiling much more dense than the big one, right? You don't want that. You want the uniform scale. The way you achieve that is by selecting both of these objects. You just select them, unwrap, and you choose previous seam selection you see that the seams are selected now for both of the objects and you unwrap both of them at the same time. In doing so, you make sure that the scale of the unwrap for both of these objects is exactly the, you know, the correct scale. And now we can actually, you know, clean things up. So I will most likely do something like this. Let, let me quickly prepare a setup like that. As I said, this is the most complicated uh, variation uh, of, of unwrap, and I just want to teach you that so that, you know, you don't get stuck if you need to do something complex. Uh, everything else for the boxes and so on, that's gonna be easy peasy, uh, you'll see. So, here, uh, this is the bottom edge, so I don't really care about it. I'm just going to rotate it horizontally like that. And this can be just placed here, whatever. Triangle for now lives there. <laughs> uh, then this one uh, also rotate. That That's a bottom edge here. Uh, this will be visible actually. So I will be rotating it properly and placing it somewhere here. 
and I will be keeping an eye out for it. Then, 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 then we have this edge right here that is weirdly rotated. So I just rotate it in place. You'll see how Rhino 8 is better at this, hopefully. At least more convenient, right? Then the other one, which one was it? Oh, this is the inner one, right? The outer and the inner one. The inner ones don't matter as much, but I still have them um, folding out like that, uh, simply because it's nice to have clean geometry. Okay, that I think I should do a time lapse of this because it's just me rotating things. Okay, we're done. So I at the end I scaled it up uh, to fit better in, in the, how do I call this, UV space, I guess. Besides that, everything is kind of aligning vertically, hopefully. I, I don't think I made any mistakes. Of course here there's it's gonna be funky, but it should be a much, like, much better way of how it tiles. And then I just hit apply, right? Show, synchronize back in here already synchronized chef's kiss tiling is great with that of course the scale needs to be like 0.5 oops uh, 0.05 yeah something like that uh, you can also uh, make some like oh wait it doesn't offset? What the hell? Oh, okay, it offsets in, in Y because X is very linear, clearly. So you can you can offset to get like a nice alignment of the seam. For instance, in my case, I want the... Oh, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> I wanted that. That was the plan. Or maybe you want your cladding here to be right from the middle. Then you just play around with it. That's the wrong one. Play around with it minus or okay zero zero point zero one zero point zero uh zero five four <laughs> four or five there we go okay oh no it, it doesn't do four digits after the comma okay whatever no one will know don't tell anyone Okay, so you end up having this aluminum aluminum cladding right on the on the roof. Now, if I take the same aluminum cladding and I put it, uh, where do I want to put it? Here, right here on this part of the facade because I think it would look kind of cool. Bam, that already looks pretty good. Except that this is horizontal, <laughs> this part, and this part is vertical, and this part is very dense. <laughs> But at least the alignment is correct. That's because it's boxes, right? And boxes are much easier to work with. Let me show you how to work with the boxes. So, it, oh, and also later I'll, or maybe I should do it now. Okay, let me first do the Rhino 8 thing. The same thing in Rhino 8, and then I will show you the, the box mapping thing. In Rhino 8, you need to um, the Rhino 8 is a little bit different, right? If you do, if you select these and you do UV editor, then you can see that it opens up a new window completely. And as you're, you know, unwrapping, or rather, let's let's unwrap that one. As you're unwrapping, the, the procedure is still exactly the same, right? I already have this this map mark marked out, but then. Um, in, in this UV editor window, you can also use the texture. Um, it's it, it's here where you make make adjustments. So they, they made it much more comfortable, right? Comfortable to use. Still compared to other types of software. Oh, this this is a little bit annoying. Uh, let me show you. Okay, how to fix this <laughs> this particular one, right? Sometimes it unwraps in a weird like a ribbon. It unwraps in a weird way. 
So if you want to straighten the edges, you select the first edge here, Control Shift click, select, you select the last edge here, Control Shift click, and then double click, Control Shift double click on any edge in between. Never mind, it doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, I don't know. And you just scale them to zero, right? To have them straight. Same thing here, edge, edge. You just select the edges. I have no idea why does it, oops, so weird. It should just give me, wait, maybe that's, nope. Anyway, um, it, it just gives me like we weird stuff here. So I'm, I'm just going to straighten it out here as well. And then this area, that's going to be easy. This area, uh, I should turn off the material. Uh, sorry, the texture. Z scale to zero here. Get the middle ones, scale to zero here. And now you have a very clean topology. And I believe the topology is going to be for the, yeah, that, that's for the inside, right? And you can see how squished now it gets. So you need to, of course, adjust it. You know, adjust the seam so that it's not, not as squished anymore. But that's how you, how you can stra straighten it out, right? By just selecting the edges and scale, scaling them. Uh, once you're done, you can click on this uh, pack texture meshes button, and it will, you know, kind of pack all of this islands neatly, right? So that that's also a very very useful useful thing. Besides that, it's it's exactly the same procedure as in Rhino Seven. Just wanted to point out that in Rhino Eight, it's it's a little bit less painful. Still pretty painful, but less. All right, let's talk about box mapping. So, well, kind of, yeah, box mapping. This particular object that I have here, actually it's aligned, yeah, it's aligned with X and Y axis. That's great, that's that's great. So, um, but the stairs are not, that's even better. So I'm, I'm going to show you one uh, method that works on the facade, which will not work on the stairs because they're off axis, right? They're kind of tilting a bit. Um, so the method that I'm talking about is if I select this poly surface here and I choose, uh, let's expand that. I choose uh, texture mapping, scroll, scroll. And I choose apply box mapping like that. It's going to ask me, okay, what's the box from which the texture should be mapped on my geometry? And the textures, the way they're going to be mapped is going to be, imagine a box is created around your geometry and the textures are just projected from X, Y, and Z directions onto the geometry. So, uh, and th the textures are, it's basically the same texture from all sides, right? So the box gets um, projections box mapping makes projections from all sides. There's also a spherical mapping, which basically takes a sphere and projects the sphere onto the geometry and then there's cylindrical mapping and so on, right? So, but this clearly needs a box map. So to do so uh, with box mapping, right? Um, once I have selected the geometry and click on box mapping, it asks me what's, uh, what kind of type do you, do you want to use? And for this, I will use everything that is aligned with world X, Y coordinates is very easy. By default, it says bounding box. We're okay with that. So I hit enter. By default, it's a C plane. We're okay with that. We press enter. By default, it says capped. We press enter and that's it. It creates a box map. Now, if I were to show you the way the texture style, you can see that the textures are tiling weird. This is more stretched out. This is more squished, but we can adjust that. And the adjustment for that is right here. So this is X, Y, Z size of the box, right? That is being mapped. And we can press the one, one, one sign here. So that just simply changes the mapping size to one centimeter. Notice that our units is centimeters. That's the ideal uh, unit to use for working with twin motion, by the way. And if I zoom in here, 
I can't zoom in as much, but you can start seeing that the, it's actually not a gray texture. It's just this uh, grid texture being tiled insane like amount of times. Uh, so what we're going to do is now we're going to click on lock and we're going to choose a hundred, a hundred centimeters. So every one meter, this texture will repeat, right? One meter, one meter, one meter. Synchronize. Look at this. All right. Now the cladding repeats every one meter. There is an issue now, and the issue is called the cladding here and the cladding here. That need, th those two need to be two separate materials. While uh, here they're clearly this, uh, using the same material. So if I change the scale of one of them, you know, to fit, this one messes up. But we will attack that uh, a little bit later. For now. Uh, just understand that if our scale is set to one here, the texture, oh, come on, okay, one, not 0 0.0001, one, the texture will tile every one meter, right? Because that's what we wrote in Rhino right here. If you actually want to see the mapping box, the box that is used to project, you can click on this icon right here, show mapping. And that's going to show you the box. This is very, very useful when you want to align your geometry uh, or sorry, your texture to start from, for instance, a corner. I can take this box because right now, um, let me go back to twin motion and change the, the offsets to zero and zero here. I want this seam right here to be without any offsets for the UVs. I want it to be aligned with the corner right here. What do I do? I go in Rhino. I take, I click on show mapping. I take this box and I move the box. M, enter, move the bottom left corner or the right corner of, of the box. I move it to align with the edge here on which I want to map onto, right? I go back in here. Oh, synchronize. Go back into in motion. And now the seam is perfectly aligned, right? That's neat. That that's that's kind of nice. Ain't gonna lie, that's that's kind of nice. So, then the question is, okay, how do I make, you know, the the, the rest of the facade have exactly the same frequency of detail? Well, that's very at this point, it's very simple. You just need to set up one. So let me hit escape two times to get rid of the show mapping tool. Let me select, for instance, this poly surface right here, which is also part of this uh, cladding, right? And I will just choose match mapping and click on the cladding. So now this, you can see from here already, I have the surface selected. It inherits the exactly same uh, mapping as what this one has. If I were to show the texture mapping of this, its projection box is also located on this corner, right? And perhaps I don't want it to be that. I want the mapping box to be kind of aligned with probably the entrance, right? So somewhere here. There we go. Oh, where the hell did I snap to? Right there. There we go. Okay. Synchronize. Look at it. I mean, oh, I, I snapped poorly. <laughs> so it's it's not uh, not aligning properly. Let's let's fix that. Isolate. Every time when you're kind of having troubles with snapping, you just isolate things. Uh, show mapping. What was the mistake there? Oh yeah, clearly it was snapping to something wrong. M enter, snap to that, show, synchronize, take a look. Now it's aligning there prop properly and you know, ev everything's neat and dandy. And I'll do the same thing for this one as, as well. Match mapping, oh yeah, there's a command by the way, match mapping, I'll just use that, enter, this one is now fixed, uh, show mapping, uh, these two isolate or this one isolate, uh, show mapping again, 
no that was not that show map ping oh really there's okay i'll just click the button i guess bam m let's try i think this seam is more important than this seam i think so uh let's see okay uh we just wait what if i synchronize only this wall yeah it it understands what's hidden and what's not that's good good to know so let's show escape cancel out of that uh synchronize boom that's done I have questions. <laughs> I, I I have I have many many questions about how the hell does it did it determine that the roof should not. Oh, it had to rebuild the whole thing. One second. I need to think about this, if this is going to be a problem for you guys. Probably not. Probably not. So don't synchronize with hidden stuff. Let me try one more thing. Isolate, synchronize. Like that, okay. And then show, synchronize. Ha. Huh. So that kills the materials. It didn't do that before in, in previous updates. So that, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So don't hide stuff and synchronize. You know, that, that, that's bad. Uh, with that being said, just slapping on aluminum on the facade is, you know, just drag and drop it in. Oh, you didn't see it. I, I, I had it here and just drag and drop it in. And now everything is aligned again nicely. Like that, right? Huh, that, that's cool. Um, if you have too many materials here and there are some that are not being used, you can just click on this purge tool or cleanup tool and it just will remove all of the materials that are not currently being used. That's, that's a useful tool to have or, or to use. Now, okay, we have ourselves a facade material. I want the roof material to be, you know, the same, but different, different amount of tiling. So what I need to do with it is I select the facade material. I right click on it, right click on the facade material, duplicate, right? Now it's duplicated. I can click on these three dots here and I can choose to rename it. And I'm just going to rename it, rename, hello, rename of roof panels, right? and just drag and drop it in. So now I have two materials that I can change separately. Very useful, very nice. Um, what was it, uh, if I remember correctly, 0 0.004 for alignment and very small scale. Smaller. Oops, not that small though, not that small, uh, smaller than that, no, uh, there are ways of how to make it nicer, but I can't be bothered. <laughs> Oh yeah, and now the offset does not match up anymore. So let's do 0 0.005. Okay, seven. Okay, eight. Okay, nine. Okay, it's gonna be just 0 0.01. Okay, it's not <laughs> 0 0.095. Okay, yeah, but then it snaps to nine. That's fine, that's fine. We are okay with that. 
So we have ourselves a metal, metal facade. If I were to render it, it's a little bit more convincing that it's metal. It's a little bit too metal, um, but we'll, we'll fix it la later on, that's fine. For now, I just need the material on there and the glossiness and so on, that's gonna be, gonna be solved, right? So that's um, in terms of the boxes that are um, boxy geometry that's aligned with world X, Y coordinates. If you have geometry, these staircases, that's not aligned with the world uh, X, Y coordinates, then th the procedure is the same. I'm just going to take, uh, for instance, this uh, step right here, uh, and I'm going to choose a box map, apply box map, but I'm not going to use a bounding box. No, no, no. I'm going to use a three point box, three point, and I'm going to specify where does the box start where is the where is the x axis of the box? So click once, click twice. Where is the y axis of the box? And where is the z axis? Oh, z is just up, right? So I just click, 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 and drag out and click fourth time, I guess, uh, to create a box, right? And then I just hit enter for it to stop asking me if it's if it should be capped or not. And now this is uh, properly mapped right if i go for uv editor for this one just draw it out somewhere doesn't matter where and i look at it you can clearly see let's not look at the wireframe uh you can clearly see that you know the the everything's aligning properly but the size of it is weird so i'm going to do the same thing here as well 111 lock up up to 100 show the box and just make it align uh, move enter from bottom corner to here and now this is perfectly aligned right so apply sure skip out wait why is this what one second uv editor Oh, it's broken again. What the hell? But it's not. <laughs> this is so weird. This is so strange. Because here it says 222. Oh, I know what's happening. It writes it into the texture slot. Okay, so don't hit apply ever. Uh, always hit cancel when you're dealing with bounding box. You're just using this to preview. You're not using it to apply the UV editor edits. Right, so you just hit cancel. So I'm, I'm gonna need to do it again, but I'm gonna do it fast. Bounding box, uh, no, three point box, from here to here to here to here. That sizes really don't matter. One, 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 lock, 100, 100, 100. Show mapping, show mapping. Where the, oh, there it is. That's weird. What's going on? This, okay. Am I showing the mapping of a wrong thing? Show mapping? No, I'm not. Okay. Anyway, you can always adjust the mapping as well. So you can just select the box, you know, the mapping box, move to this corner, rotate to force an alignment. And I know for a fact that it's one by one by one meter. So we're happy with this. This is the correct step. Uh, which means that I can now select every single other piece of geometry. And let's just do a quicker variation of this by just going to landscape, stairs, right click, select objects and select the one that is solved. Go to properties, match, mapping, select the object. That's it. Okay. So now all of these have the exact same mapping associated with them. That is one by one mirror. So it should be like tiling properly, nicely. Uh, synchronize. Okay. Look at that. Um, that's going to be concrete, right? Materials, concrete. Hmm. Polished? No. Poured? No. That That's nice, but it's not the outside concrete thing. Styrated concrete is kind of cool. But it's very cheap. I kind of want it. No, no, 
No. Oh no. No 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 no. Hmm. No, it's very intense. Hmm. All right. Okay. Something like this. Uh, and then taking a look at the scale of it. That doesn't seem too bad. I'm going to check the the naming of the concrete. Bare concrete zero two. Okay, it literally tells me nothing. Um, no, I think we're good. I think we're good. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to it. All right. So that's our concrete. Concrete stairs and everything's aligning properly. So from here on out, um, okay. From here on out, it's basically me just going around changing the UV coordinates of different things and applying materials, right? I will not be doing anything extra. I'm, I'm just going to be doing that. I feel like this should be a time lapse rather than me just explaining every single thing that I do. Uh, with that being said, maybe the last thing is going to be the glass, right? Because here under materials, glass, clear glass, I think is there like oh, one second yeah that's the two-sided one and that's the clear one okay so you you should use the clear glass rather than the two-sided glass for uh, you know for for uh, a facade uh, with that being said I think no that's item glass okay that that's gonna be annoying Reflective glass, yeah, uh, exactly. Okay, so clear glass is good if you want to show what's inside. Reflective glass is good if you want to reflect the outside more, right? So for me, for the facades that I do, I prefer to use the reflective glass and also I prefer to tint it a little bit darker. So that once, once it's kind of being rendered, it's, uh, you know, it, it looks, stuff inside looks a little bit darker i, I don't know I, I i like it more this way all right purge purge that that's with the glass in slowly slowly building it up okay so now next steps are exactly the same i'm just going to use bounding box mapping i'm going to use i don't think i will use unwrap anywhere else no it's just going to be bounding box mapping for literally everything and maybe some uh, shenanigans with the tilting beams here but probably I won't bother and just use <laughs> box mapping for them as well so I, I guess it's time for a yeah l l let's do a fast forward on this one
All right, it seems like we are mostly done. Let me purge that. We are mostly done with the texturing, All right? Uh, there are certain areas, that's the garage. There are certain areas where I will need to add more detail, but that's expected. And that's going to be the next step. We are going to be modeling on top of the existing model to introduce more detail. Uh, but before we do that, of course, I still need to add some texture to the ground and also add at least a little bit of scattering, you know, scatter uh, at least a few objects here. Also, I decided that the railing is going to be glass, so there is going to be a lot of 3D modeling going on with the framework, uh, with the framing of it. Should be fine. Should be fine. In terms of the ground material, I believe we have some. Where is it? Where is it? Should be somewhere here. Come on. There it is. Ground. Nature. And here we can just add in um, forest or grassy, grassy ground, bam, like that, for that one as well. And of course the resolution needs to be adjusted. I'll use this, uh, the step to decide on the, the scale, right? So I guess, wait, smaller. Hello? What the hell? Oh, was it? Oh, my bad, my bad. Let me just delete that out. Oh, I can't. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I can't because that one is using this. So I instead I will do that and then delete. Okay. The tick marks mean that the material is being used, thus you can, can't delete it. So let's make the scale smaller. The smaller the scale, the more accurate it's gonna be up close, but the more of a repetition you're gonna see. Don't be scared of the repetition. It's fine. We will make it make it work. So that that that's not an issue. The main task right now is to get the the moss scale correct. I think something like is that too much? I think that's too much. Yeah, something like that. Something like that will do the trick. The repetition of this will be uh, fixed so don't don't worry about that too much right so now there's going to be next yeah we're, we're moving on to the next chapter which is going to be called <laughs> 3d modeling or detailing de de detailing the 3d model all right Let's talk about detailing, detailing of your 3D models for visualization purposes. Technically, you could spend months just detailing the model, you know, making sure that everything has, um, you know, that you can zoom into everything, every single angle, every single nook and cranny and every single kind of corner bracket is solved and is there. We will not be doing that. Sometimes you need to do that. In this case, we will not be doing that. And throughout your education, you will not need to do that. The way we are going to look at the detailing is basically hiding things uh, that would otherwise be very prominent in your renders. Let me give you an example. For instance, this area right here, right, is going to just be dirt. Right. And I could plant some trees and some nice little moss and grass and so on and make like a nice garden out of this area. Sure. But it would require me to spend so much time arranging everything that I think 3D modeling some form of a little terrace here, you know, some paved. Come on, some paved pathway here that that's just going to go a long way. So, you know, a little bit something here just to fill in this space. For example, here in this awkward gap right here, I, I will not be doing anything with that because this gap will be hidden by the rocks and the reeds and the weeds and so on. Right. So I will use assets to hide the lack of detail in this particular area. The railing is going to be detailed because this is now glass and glass needs framing. So we will fix that part as well. 
So now there's two, you know, this area right here and the framing right here. Then I could choose to do the top of these stairs, right? And have some sort of a different type of a material for the top of the stairs. But in reality, these would be concrete cast stairs. So I don't think I need to. There will be, um, probably, most likely, later on, there will be a little bit of work to be done with the floor here. And of course, you know, generally filling in the space, but that's not now. Right now, we're just looking at what kind of problems can we solve geometrically, you know, in, in Rhino. If I were to hide, oh, I, I hit too much. Let me try again. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah, that's fine. Hide that. If I were to hide uh, the roof, here you can see the railing, right? As well as the staircase. And actually, let me just, where are they? Where are they? Where are you hiding? There we go, stairs, select sublayer objects, isolate. There we go. So this is the vertical connection, you know, the staircase, two staircases, um, very simple runs and the railing, the copper railing that follows, right? The problem with that staircase right now is that it's all the same material and I'm using white, white material for it, right? So what I want to do here is I want to add a little bit of a detail for the top surface of the staircase and I want that to be in wood. So that's going to be also a detail that's going to be added. And I think with that, we're going to be at three different areas that I will work on. Let me just take a look at different angles. So from this perspective, everything is going to be fine. We're going to add a little bit of grass here. That's going to be hidden. That's fine. Then if I will need to add uh, some paving here, I can always do that later on by just kind of creating a box that follows along. This particular angle I don't really like, or rather not an angle, but the way ground meets the terrace here, I don't really like, but that, that should be, yeah. Uh, th there's nothing that I can add there. Or rather there is, but I don't want to uh, o overdo it, right? I, I will still need to see how much does the greenery hide so that I don't model, you know, unnecessarily. And this terrace is just huge. So that is, will require a lot of um, furniture, furniture pieces here. Let me hide. Where are the, there's, there we go, glazing. Let's hide the glazing and let's take a look at what we have here. <clears throat> So this is quite empty. And for instance, here you can clearly see that, um, let's zoom into that area and actually hide that. There needs to be a door here. There's multiple places where we, we need to have doors and this is one of them, right? So what I'm going to do, so this needs to be a door, right? Uh, what we're going to do is model out a single kind of insert the door and then place it in multiples of these um, these areas because this is not the only one. You can clearly see that. Let me isolate actually. You can clearly see that, you know, this insert is waiting for a door to happen just like this one as well. <clears throat> so that's going to be detail number four. Okay, we're at <clears throat> my voice. Oh no, I will need to take a break. Um, we are at four. Uh, details and I think that's that's good enough, right? So I'll start with the first one and of course we I, I will be doing time lapses of the 3d modeling because I, I Mean you should know how to model by now, right? First learn how to model then learn how to render that's 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 how it goes All right, so we begin with uh, I guess the railing. Yeah, I want to do the railing
Okay, this should be good enough. Um, there's going to be panels. Uh, maybe if I do Arctic view, you'll see better. Sure, sure you will. Um, there's going to be panels uh, and like rivets or whatever it's called, like metal rivets that are holding the panels in place um, with some metal siding here. And I think if I wait a minute, did I mess it up? Oh, right, right, right. And this needs to be carved in. So Boolean difference from this with the metal panels. Perfect. Now everything is a-okay, it seems. Except this area, which is for some reason a little bit funky. Oh yeah, yeah, that's because these guys are climbing on top. That, that, that's fine, that's fine. That's fine, that's because of the stairs. Okay, so that's one done. Uh, then we have uh, three more to go. So now I'm going to do the inner courtyard thing with a little terrace and a pathway. Okay, second one done. So this is going to be very simple. A terrace, concrete base with planks on top, carved out by the framing, right? And then we have a paving that's going to be same material as the staircase with two of the pavement bricks basically extending outwards towards some sort of a, I don't know, Maybe there's gonna be like a nice tree here or something like that, right? Basically, we're going to hug this space and we're going to make flower a flower garden here. A tree is going to be like a focus point here. And then everything else is just going to become more and more wild as we're moving out, you know, along the pathway. Um, since this is, um, what you gonna call it? Since this is a, proper project that we are doing for a client, I know for a fact that this area right here uh, has a small river. So perhaps the pathway is towards that river uh, thing. Maybe I'll add some water in the model as well. We'll see, we'll see. All right, so that's detail number two. Literally one, two, 20, 22 boxes nothing more <laughs> just 22 boxes detailing okay let's move on to detail number three All right, detail three, complete. So the stairs now have pops right there. Basically that's going to enable me to have a uh, difference in materials, right? While the landings, no, not the landing, sorry. While the front facades of the stairs will stay white, the tops now can be oak, you know, the floor material. Um, so that's just, you know, in terms of material detailing, that's going to be super helpful. Again, a bunch of boxes, right? Uh, so the detailing up until now has been very simplistic forms, just more frequency in them. Of course, further steps would be to take the stairs and then look at, okay, can we do a shadow seam here, you know, between the, the top plate and the railing, right? By giving, giving it like, minus one centimeter, right? So we end up with this small little gap and perhaps then carving in some sort of a lighting, you know, LED lighting for them. Um, later on, we could do a fillet. 
let edge with uh, one centimeter is a bit too much uh, let's say half a centimeter uh, precisely on this area right here so that the light hits it nice when you know if we were to look at it in the arctic view well okay <laughs> it's, it's just white um, but basically that fillet makes it so that the light hits the top of the staircase landing uh, quite quite well so you know you you could start adding a crap ton of this high frequency detail but before the main things are solved you don't really need to you should just kind of focus on the you know adding in additional geometry where it is necessary right where you can't be without it so that's detail number three done let's go to detail number four which is literally modeling a door All right, that's detail number four. We have nine doors in total that are that have like a, let me isolate. They basically have the top um, board that is going to be the same material as the door itself so that visually you have a nice continuation of them. They're also going to be frameless, uh, frameless doors with a nice little handle, vertical kind of thin handle as a detail. Uh, not the most uh, convenient handles out there, but damn, do they look nice. <laughs> well, at least to me. So, with this, we are done with detailing. We have four details complete. Um, of course, I will be adding in um, the textures and so on in the further chapters uh, for these details. But besides that I, I think we're, we're good to go to our next chapter which is going to be chapter five i believe sprinkling some assets to have even higher frequency of detail i'll see you there all right moving on so the procedure of me adding the or rather importing the elements that i have modeled and adding textures to them is exactly the same i will play a quick time lapse Right, so that's that. 
And the only thing that I would like to know that's a little bit new, a new information for you, uh, is how do you deal with the fact that once you have the same material applied to two different objects, those objects from there on out are linked in twin motion. What I mean by that is, for instance, this uh, material right here, which also needs to be a little bit um, adjusted, the planks are a little bit too wide, but let's say this material right here, and then if I take it, so I guess it's this one, and apply it to these um, tiles, I guess, or on the ground, from now on, these two objects or sets of objects are linked by the material, meaning that if I then apply uh, bronze material to them, you can see that both of them change. And not just that, the top one as well, right? So that becomes a problem because now I can't have them separated anymore, right? That's an oops, uh, a whoopsie. And the way you can uh, fix it, the way you can disconnect it again, right? These, these objects is by choosing the ones that you messed up that you accidentally linked, oops, control key. Mm -hmm. I'm just holding the control key and clicking on them like that. Almost there, bear with me. Oh, we're almost there. Ten, 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 ten. There we go. So selecting all of them, going to import tab, Clicking on these three little dots on my uh, Rhino file. So uh, notice that I have my Rhino file opened. You need it to be open for this to work. The synchronization needs to be kind of running. So I click on these three dots. And while I have these objects selected, I choose to reset materials on selection. It didn't work. Wait, I think I need to synchronize here. And then let's go back in here, try that again. Oh, come on, please. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got scared there for a second. And now after I've done this, I can go back to my materials, find the material that I used to have and apply it now. Uh, again, right? So you disconnect it. Um, you disconnect materials that way. If you want to use the same material on this, as well as these tiles, but you wanted the materials, uh, sorry, this material on the tiles to be a little bit different or to still retain the possibility on changing the materials. All you need to do is just take the rough planks material, right click, duplicate, call it whatever you want, click on the three little dots, rename, uh, tiles, and just slap it on now here, right? And with this, nothing is going to be linked because this becomes a unique material, right? Even though it, visually it looks exactly the same as the material from which you duplicated. So that's that's the premise, right? Of, of how, how we work with this. All right. With that being said, I think it's time to move on to the next step. And the next step is going to be populating the geometry in our scene. This is going to be the heaviest, uh, the with this, the scene will become really heavy, so be prepared for that. Um, if I click on this Populate tab here, and let me turn off the Materials tab, we don't need it anymore, right? So Populate tab, you can see that now I have my Foliage, Paths, and Urban. I think I can start with showing you the Urban um, sub-tab, I guess, or tool set. So we're going to go backwards. I'm going to show you urban because that's the one that we're not going to be using, right? This is clearly in the middle of nature, right? So if I click on urban tab, I can choose whatever location I want. Lund, um, Sweden. Wait for it to load in or not. Oh, really? Maybe it doesn't have it, right? I didn't check if it has learned Malmo. Sweden. There we go. Okay, at least Malmo is there. Perhaps Lund is also there. Uh, maybe I, I I was just impatient, right? And let's see this cross uh, crossroad in Malmo. That's uh, industry gotten. Okay. Well, it, it's going to be large scale uh, factory uh, objects here or buildings here, right? Can expand this a little bit. Can zoom out if I want to with the scroll wheel. Download and place. 
We need to wait a little bit for it to do its magic, but once it's done, it's going to populate the whole scene with particularly these buildings that, yeah, there we go. And it's not going to be pretty, of course, because this is all open street map data, right? But for volume studies and so on, I think this is a pretty, uh, pretty cool tool to have, right? So if you need to scrape some 3D data from any model, uh, or not any model, from any map, you can do so with the urban setting here. A good, good tool to know, but not a tool that we're going to be using in this um, course or in this tutorial. So I'll control Z. I can't control Z, clearly. Okay, cool. Let's go back to populate and let's figure things out. Or do I just... Yeah, I'll, I'll just select the context folder here. So basically now we have two folders in our scene, right? Our two in motion course, like the, the Rhino file folder that I have, which contains all of the geometries. And then we have the context folder. And I will just select the whole context folder and just hit delete and it's gone, right? So now we've reset it. And I did control Z too many times. So I, I need to go in here and apply the material real fast. There we go. That's fixed. And now back back to back to where we were. Why is this white? Because it has to be white, okay. <laughs> back to where we were. Back to populate tab, right? That was the urban, uh, ur urban menu. Now we have the paths menu. The paths menu is basically you defining where cars, people, or bicycles, honestly, or custom objects should move along, like paths that things move along. So let's go for character and let's just draw a path from here to here to here, let's say. Enter. Wait, is it not enter? Is it escape? Yeah, it's escape. I'm, I, I never use this clearly, right? So I don't know. But it's basically you're, you're defining, you know, people that will walk along along your path. And again, if I were to <clears throat> uh, make this smaller, you can see that there's character path uh, rollout here, right? Same thing for cars, same thing for everything. You can choose the between African, Asian or Caucasian person type, people type, race. Um, or you can, not or, but and, you can change the path after you've drawn it, of course, right? And then so on. So there, there's a bunch of adjustments there. Most of them are very much self-explanatory, right? What kind of closing they, they should have, what's the width of the path, right? And what's the density of the people, right? Um, cool for urban setting, for this, it's useless. So I will not be using that, right? Back to populate. We have bicycles, we have vehicles. They work exactly the same way. Custom objects, if I were to boom, boom, boom draw a weird shape, I guess, right? I have a box right now that that is moving, but I can go to, let's say trees and I can add in a tree and now I have a tree that's moving along the path. I guess, I mean, again, we don't really, I mean, it's kind of cute, but uh, we, we don't really need it. So I'm going to delete it, but that's basically paths, right? And then, most important thing, foliage. That's the thing that we're going to be using quite a bit. Um, let's start with me saying that there are two variations. Oh, let's start with me saying that twin motion foliage is not the highest quality uh, trees and greenery that you can get, you know, from the library. There are much higher quality ones, but at least these ones uh, work on low end computers just as well as it works on high-end computers, right? So it's performance versus quality, right? That type of a uh, foliage. Uh, for what we're going to be doing, that's absolutely fine. But the moment you're kind of reaching that 99% realism, right? W when you want to do that last 1%, um, the quality of the trees and so on starts becoming an issue. Won't be an issue for this course though, so let's move on. So we have uh, two ways of how we can deal with foliage. We can paint it on like with a brush 
or we can scatter it. I'll first show you scatter because that's the tool that we will not be using, but I still want to show it to you. So let's say this whole surface right here that I have, this, this whole thing, I want to scatter with uh, grass and then so on and weeds and blah, 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 right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select it. Let me just kind of get close to it. I'm going to select it, populate, or wait, maybe I don't even need to select it. I keep messing up the different softwares. I, I don't think you even need to select. Just go to populate, scatter, foliage, scatter, and drag and drop in some greenery. So I'm going to go to vegetation, grass and flowers, and I'll choose uh, the first one. Let's say lawn, no, that looks ugly. Mm -hmm. That's not bad, that's kind of nice dry grass wild grass i like the wild one dry wild grass yeah I, I like this one so i'll just drag and drop it into this window right here so now this is something that you picked from the library and you're going to be you have the potential of using it you're not using it right now because you haven't clicked on it but you can so if i click on it now you can see that i have my size option for it so this is basically how big the blades of grass should be and then in the details there's much more uh, options here but first let's uh, scatter it so that i can show you so i'm just going to select it i'm going to click on this scatter tool th this icon right here and i'm going to just click on the ground right and it scatters some blades of grass they don't look great uh, on the you know in, in this kind of a rendered preview but if I click on the render, it's a little bit better. I mean, yes, it, it's still pretty bad, but once we get to the density, to a higher density, it's going to look fine. So let's get to higher density. How do you do that? Well, you click one more time. That's higher density. One more time. Even higher density, right? And you keep clicking until you, you're satisfied with the density of grass that you that you have, right? So I'm thinking something like that, maybe. Yeah, something like that. If you don't like this, if you want to remove it, you click on the remove scatter and then you reduce the density, right? There's also erase. If I erase, if I choose the erase tool and I just hit anywhere here, I can erase the scatter of that particular asset in this particular area. We will use this a little bit later. I'll control Z from it, right? So with this density done, let me find another type of grass. Uh, we're using dry wild grass. Let's just use wild grass to kind of get some, some normal grass spots in here. Oh, messed it up. Um, if, if you lose the populate tab, you can always just select your, your grass blades and you're back in your scatter vegetation um, object. Uh, it does create an object in itself, right? That is selectable on the scene, in the scene, right? And you can zoom into it and blah, blah, blah. You can do all of the, you know, all of the things that you do with, um, with these uh, objects. You can even move it up if you want to. No, you can't. I lied to you. Apparently it's glued to the surface. You used to <laughs> be able to. Anyway, if I choose wild grass now and drag that one in, you can see that currently the scattering, it doesn't really change. It just uses the same wild dry grass asset. But if I were to select this somehow, choose wild grass and click on the scatter tool. Now I can add it in, right? And basically it adds in a second layer of dry wild grass. I notice that as I zoom out the textures or not the textures, but the preview changes, that's just so that my computer doesn't explode, right? So let me just take a look. Maybe we add a little bit more. Yeah, that sounds, or that looks fine. Let's add some tall grass. One, two, three, maybe. Um, dandelions, yeah, dandelion seems nice, oops forgot to drag it in so now I need to select the whole damn thing there we go dandelions get that one in here uh, 
And I think we are kind of reaching the density. That's going to be sufficient. No, uh, a little bit more. Tall grass too. Oh, I already have that one in here. So let me delete it. Uh, tall, tall grass three. Right, scatter that one in. So you're basically just building up layers and you're just playing around with the density of things, right? Trying to figure out what what's lacking. Uh, if I hit escape now, yeah, that's not, not too bad. Let's hit render. Let's see how it looks. It's still pretty clumpy, but this looks much more, I would say this looks much more realistic as a as a scene right you can still see the ground through it but the ground is not that bad of course once we add the trees and so on this will look even even better with that being said and and that's basically how you scatter things right you just kind of keep keep adding them keep removing them and then if you need to um boop, like that or sorry or rather just tall grass I, I just want to see i never use the eraser tool so let's make the the diameter of the eraser tool smaller and try to uncover our pathway yeah okay it only removes the selected objects which is nice but i kind of need to there we go you know erase through here and then you would be hand picking you know hand brushing on the the assets on on the pathway like that uh, messed it up okay good enough around the pathway not on the pathway sorry good enough right okay let's escape escape out of there take a look here I'll let, there's a whole damn <laughs> yeah there's a lot of crap going on here let me increase the diameter bam just kind of Draw, draft it out you know pathway or something yeah you get a you get the idea right so that's the typical typical scattering i don't use it because it's too uniform or rather i do use it but i only use it for the further um, area if I need to have it so we'll see maybe we will use a little bit of scattering for this outer ring right here but for the inner ring we don't really we don't really need the scattering right so I'm going to delete it instead I'm going to show you a much more precise way of how to add in foliage and that is if I go to populate I go to paint you can paint on the foliage right so let's make our brush a diameter of uh, three meters something like that that seems decent and uh, which ones did I use I used the tall grass I'll, I'll just grab all three of them damn it okay I'll just grab all three tall grasses okay one two fine three three of those um should we add anything else no for now let's just have three different types of tall grasses later we'll add clover clovers and dandelions and so on i will turn off the paintbrush tool or rather i will select every single one of these individually and you can see that with the paintbrush tool i can choose the different densities for different assets meaning that i can say that well i like the tall grass 01 more than tall grass 02 so i can say that its density should be actually around 80 percent Tall grass 02 should be only 60%. Tall grass 03, maybe it's 50%. I just brush it on. So choose the brush tool. And we take a look at the, you know, output that we got. If overall the density is too high, you can always, you know, choose any one of these grasses and you can reduce their density and you can see that it updates in real time, right? So you can make it very kind of low density or you can just increase it to 100% for everything. And that, then it becomes very high density. That was weird. Why is tall grass three messing things up? Hmm. Either a bug or a feature. I'm not sure, <laughs> right? 
And then for every single one of these assets, you can also go to the details tab right here and you can choose the dryness of them. So see how they become a little bit more yellow. Let me change to let's zoom, zoom, zoom. These leaves right here. If I change the dryness to zero, they're green. Now they're just yellow. You can make the, make it striped, but let's not do that. Striped is basically like, you, you know, the golf fields. Oh, sorry. You know, the golf fields and how they have stripes or the football field, how they have stripes on the grass. That's that's the stripes. We don't need them, right? It's, it's a little bit more natural here. And then, of course, you can also just keep on adding in, you know, painted on um, greenery, such as weeds, right? Weeds will not at least to my knowledge, will not pop in here. Let's actually double check. Uh, actually, they are popping in here. Okay, that's my bad. If I reduce the density of everything else, now the weeds are showing up and, and so on, right? So in total, the density, I believe the density needs to reach 100% and it can't go beyond that. So you always balance out the density between different types types of grass if you want to have even more density you know in in a particular area for instance here then you would go to populate again paint and you would dr uh, brush on let's say long grass uh wild grass sorry wild grass or dry wild grass and where's the dandelions that we had bam dandelions right these three guys and i just draw them on and now you can see that you know the density is is doubled in that particular area and if i just keep our keep on drawing out here uh the density in in this case in this area we are only have these three that's because <clears throat> these three assets that's because now we have two painted vegetation assets one here one here right and you can just keep on painting on different vegetations on top of um, one another, right? If now with the extremely high density, if I go in here, and I'll be a little bit awkward with the, how close I'm getting and I hit the render key. This is starting to become, you know, starting to look quite, quite convincing, quite real, right? So the way you work is you create high density areas where your camera is going to be looking at and everywhere else is going to be low density areas because if you try to reach 100% density or extreme density of your grass and, and so on in all of the areas from every single angle, there is not, I mean, your, your computers will not handle that, right? So it's much better to uh, be selective, right? With that being said, or actually let's, let's keep the painted vegetation Shall I go around the perimeter as a time lapse and, and just paint out the, the, the quick perimeter? I, I think I will. I, I think I will. All right, so we're done with the base coat, so to say, of weeds and grass and so on. In total, I have, let's see, 
four vegetation layers. Let me turn them off so that you can see we can see better, right? And I guess it's quite useful to also rename them to what they actually are. So for instance, painted vegetation four, if I tick mark this, those are the flowers that we have here, right? So I would just right click on, the, uh, on this, rename, and choose flowers, flowers paint. Then the next one is clovers, clovers and green grass, or, you know, something that is a little bit more, um, a little bit less wild, I guess, a little bit more connected with, you know, people who are living here and taking care of this, at least this portion of the land. So plucking away the weeds and whatnot. So this painted vegetation is going to be renamed to inner garden paint. Then we have this whole thing, which is basically our uh, dandelions. Yeah, right. The, the, the yellow flowers, the dandelions, dry wild grass and wild grass. So it's the outer perimeter. And you can see, by the way, it's hard for me to show you the extents of it because as I zoom out, it clips away the preview of them, right? So I can't show you the whole thing, but basically I'm I'm going around 50 meters out from the building at around like 30 to 50 meters away from the building and just painting in uh, two layers, right? Of these. And once that's done, or oh, I uh, missed a spot. Once that is done, it's gonna look like that, right? And basically one is for a lower uh, level vegetation and the second one is for taller vegetation uh, that would grow on top of this. And we end up with uh, this kind of preview. By the way, if it's even worse for you in terms of displaying the vegetation and you see that your, you know, if I click on the stats, uh, the frames per second, they're not dropping at all and they're, everything's green, then you can go to, well, you can go to quality setup and first check if uh, there's anything here that's not set to ultra, right? And also you can, well, let's cancel, you can go to edit, preferences, grass fading, and here you can choose far rather than medium. That should be good enough, right? If you really want to push it, by the way, well, no, later, later. I'll show you how to amp up the quality later. For now, let's let's keep things going fast, right? So at this stage, make sure to save quite often because this, you know, the moment you start scattering things, uh, you're prone to crashing. Um, so yeah, make sure that you're saving. Now, with all of these four scatters done or paints done, let's do the third plan meaning the outer perimeter. And for that, I will add trees. I will be adding trees to the foreground as well, but for now, it's we're just going to do the trees in the back background. And I will be using scatter for this because I can't be bothered with, you know, actually, <laughs> uh, actually painting on the trees. So I will go to my library here, vegetation, trees. Great, let's go to populate, and let's just find the trees that we would like to use. Okay, I picked out a set that I think will will work. We're going to use conifer trees, and I just picked out the prickly juniper, Austrian pine, Norway spruce, lapu pine, and sea pine. These are not trees that don't really happen in the same area, but hey, it is what it is. They, they should at least work together. Before I start scattering them, I will kind of look into the size information for each one of them. So if you select any one, uh, of the trees in the scatter menu. You can see that there's the age of them that you can control. And I'll try to kind of push all of them to be close to 10, 11 meters tall because I feel like, or, or sorry, uh, between 10 and 11 meters up to 22 meters in that range. Uh, because I feel like that's like an old forest, but not too old type of a forest vibe, right? So. My junipers are gonna be 10 meters high. My Austrian pines, clearly they grow very high. So they're gonna be at around 22 meters. Norway spruce, we can reach 20 meters with it. Aleppo pine, um, those guys are uh, maybe, let, let, let's do 11 meters for that. And sea pine, 21 meters, something like that. So I'm going to grow out the large, uh, large forest on the outskirts of my scene. 
right here, right? So I'm go just going to shift, select all of these, holding down the shift key, and I'll click on the scatter tool and just add them in, just like that. I need more, I add in more, right? Just like that. Take a look if the density is fine and if I need to remove some of them. So I don't like those guys. I assume those are C pines. I'm just going to remove, um, I guess I need to click here. I'll remove some of them from there, more. Those were not C pines, <laughs> damn it. Those are Austrian pines probably. Okay, my bad. Let's do plan B. Let's remove all of them and just keep adding in one by one so that we have more control. That's actually the drawback that you that you see. Uh, when, when you add everything at once with scatter, it's very hard to kind of custom control it, right? So let's start with prickly juniper. I'll just select that one. Add it in. Looks fine. Pretty low, uh, low, low uh, density. Add in more. Yeah, that's much better. Then Austrian pine. Once. Twice. Mm, that's too much. Okay. Remove. Norway spruce, maybe. Bam. Actually, Norway spruce could be taller. Um, I'll just densify it even more. Click anywhere here or on this area. Select Norway spruce and just increase the age of it so that it's a little bit taller. You can see how we can control the heights through the age uh, slider, right? Aleppo pine, let's add that one in. Aleppo pines could be higher, but their quality is very low. So I don't really want them to be that high. I think that's, that's gonna be fine. And last one, sea pine. So yeah, the sea pines are the weird ones. So let's work on them. If I reduce their age, how do their, wow, they grow really high. Actually, maybe we can grow out the, tr uh, the trees even more, but not these ones. So age for these ones like that, something like that. Sea pine, definitely lower. I need them young because they're just overtaking the, the, the whole, the whole outlook of, of the scene. And now we just densify a little bit more up to something like this. And I think that's gonna be it, right? Let's hit the render button, yeah. That's not too bad, right? As a, as a backdrop, this is gonna work. Don't forget, we will be adding even more uh, trees here in the, in the foreground, right? So that kind of works. Now it's time to brush on the trees, you know, for, for the second plan, right? The third plan is done. <clears throat> the second plan will need a little bit more attention. So I will be using the same, uh, same trees. So I'll populate and I'll just find my, for now, let, let's just go with prickly junipers. Actually, which ones were pretty, prettiest? I think the prickly junipers were, were kind of nice. And I'll just choose paint. Okay, that's my bad. Like that. Diameter, lower. Okay. All we need to do is now to decide basically how big we should, should this be in the, you know, closer proximity to the house. Uh, and for that, I will just brush on a few right next to the house so that we can see, you know, our relative uh, change in, in size. Um, so let me just brush on. Pop. There we go. One grew out. And for it, let's just, oh, that's the density. That's my bad. Uh, increase the size. accidentally pressed the F button so that it focused on, on both of them. Um, something like that. I kind of want them to be a, uh, a bit higher than the house itself. So perhaps growing out to be yay tall. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, that should do the trick. Okay, and let's actually delete that area right there all together. Don't need it. Okay, 
Now for the density, I'm going to use 100% density for this and then I will diminish the density as, as we as we need it uh, to be diminished, if we need it to be diminished. Also notice that every tree has a season change, um, so you can choose between, you know, summer, autumn and winter. Uh, for these guys, they are, since they are um, evergreens, evergreen trees, they don't really, <laughs> don't really care about the seasons. But if, if you're doing broadleaf trees, they will change their leaf colors. Okay, let me brush on some trees uh, maybe a larger diameter something like that there we go brush 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 something like that the reason why i'm not scattering but rather brushing in this area is because the uh, I, I want to keep the proximity to the house pretty empty right um so so the there's no trees next to the house, but at the same time, I will want to play with the shadows. So I'll, we'll need some specific, specific trees in specific areas, such as this. And also, 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 also this. Because the shadows that the trees drop, so here, uh, the shadows that the trees drop on the house are uh, important, right? They're, they're going to be important and not just the house, the, greenery as well the grass as well right so we're, we're kind of getting there with with the outlook of this i think we need some bushes right so i'm just going to go to vegetation bushes and i think we will paint a new one so i'll go to populate and i'll just create create a new uh, brush and we'll use bush base the hell is that okay let, let's take a look hmm don't like that don't like that at all so i will find a nicer one ferns are always cool lupins are nice just make sure that you're not using like weird bushes from um from areas where it's unnatural for the bushes to be in, right? Like Sahara desert plants or anything like that. Reed grass though, these guys should work quite quite well. So I, I think we will we will use some of those. Let's paint on some reed grass. That and that. And some ferns perhaps. Like that. Lesser diameter, let's just see. Yeah, that doesn't look that bad, okay. So this is going to be one of the angles, right? That, that's why I'm brushing it on here. I feel like the, why do these guys, why are these guys so small though? Didn't I play with the size of them a bit? <clears throat> And I think we need variants uh, of them. I do think we need variants. So I'm going to add in a few more things. But before we do so, um, this whole area requires a little bit of like rocks and whatnot, you know, so, so, so that it's, it's not just grass. So I'm going to choose rocks here and, you know, add, add more stuff. So give me a second, uh, another time lapse. Never mind. There's no way for us to scatter rocks in a consistent way because the rocks are always placed around their center point. They are randomly rotated by the engine and so on, sure, but they're always placed around their center point, uh, which is too bulky for me. To, to, they're, they're sticking out too much and there's no way for me to sink them into the ground um, easily with the setup that Twinmotion offers. So. You can see here, right? As I increase the density of this, this is just becoming nonsense, right? So instead of using rocks, density zero, or sorry, instead of scattering rocks, we will be simply adding and, and placing rocks. And for that, we will be being, we will be smart about it and we'll add them in later, during later stages, once we have chosen our camera angle, right? Now, with this done, I kind of want to show you the, you know, the effects that you can 
expect to have, but for that we would need to move the mouse around, right? So I will go here to the ambience rollout. And for the global lighting, I will just change the time of date, the time of day to evening. And for the details, wait, was it details? No, sorry. There should be location, sun north offset, right? So you can choose with time and date, you choose time of day. You choose how deep the shadows go. So I want them to go pretty deep. And then for the location, I just change the rotation of, of the shadows, right? Basically what I'm after is for the sun, yeah, for the sun to hit the foreground and then to hit the, uh, at least partially the building, right? And this seems like it's doing it. Let's just move it a little bit higher up. Sorry, I, I need to make sure that this whole thing works because light matters a lot. And then I drop the exposure down just a tiny bit, 0 0.5 rather than one. Hit render. You know, starting to look like something. We're happy. All right, so that is it with the scatter of the grass and then so on. We'll, by the way, we'll come back to all of this, all, all of these settings, we'll change the camera, uh, the camera angle and so on. And we'll, you know, we'll mess, mess around with this quite, quite a bit, but that's going to be later. For now, ambience, uh, we, we just changed the global lighting. Don't, don't mess with anything else. We'll, we'll get to it, right. Now let's talk about other assets that you can get into your into your scene, right? So if I zoom in here, you can get some furniture on the patio. Oh, and I forgot to add in a tree. Of course, for the vegetation, trees, and let's find, uh, there should be like a cherry tree or something like that. Is there none? Cherry. Sweet cherry tree. There, we, there it is. Just yoink it in there. I want it to be a young one. There we go. One day it will grow up. Why is it like that? That's weird. Hmm. That's a very boring tree. I'm sorry, but uh, I, I need to find a more interesting one. Mm -hmm. Blackthorns looks cool. Why not? Increase the age. Yeah, that that's much better. Okay, some you know some improvement in in in, in this particular area, which clearly you know is designed as if it's an important important area. Let's grab a rock. Scale it down. Oh, uh, I, I just say scale it down. So you can scale it down through the menu here by just choosing what's what's the size that you're after, or you can scale it, you know, by clicking this icon right here and then just um, click and dragging the middle area, the, the 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 middle node that you have there, right? Then move or rather rotate because that gives you three axes. Get that one in here. Something like that. Oops, messed up there. There's gonna be one rock somewhere here. Move it down. And then another one. I hope that Alt key dragging works. No, it doesn't. Okay, Control C, Control V, instance. That's perfect. Move it over here. Rotate like that. And just move it along here. Okay, that's great. Now a little bit of trimming, of course. It's very important. Diameter. I just select the tree, uh, not tree, but uh, sorry, the blades of grass and uh, I just trim them, trim them away just like that. For where the 
where the rock is and clearly there needs to be a little bit more more trimming done here we're reaching that you know the the area or not not the area but the time when it's it's detail work so i th there's not a lot for me to just talk about basically you just go through the motions and you know clean things and add things and work with compositions and so on i will not be cleaning it too much but yeah there we go we have two rocks and a tree stuck between two rocks you know and that that's the that's the thing that you visit all right stuff here that area is bad so i'll slap on a rock in there can the rock stick out a bit more that's too small. Is that good enough? Yeah, that's good enough. Like that. So, placing assets is very simple, as you can see. Copy paste and just keep on adding them, Add, adding them in, rotating them around, and you know, f finding finding not use cases, but how do I call this? finding them how can they intersect with the geometry that you have modeled and that you have imported because if they don't intersect if they don't overlay properly then the model will seem out of place and you don't want that let's see if i can move it around no i can't okay so we are stuck with this but if i just move it really deep now yeah that's gonna be fine Let's see if that's too intense. It's a little bit intense. This one needs to not be that intense. And here you can actually use the scale around the Z axis to make them a little bit flatter. Just like that. Oh, come on. Now it's pretty hard to catch one. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll catch it through here. Was it rock five? No, 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 no. Yes. There it is. Good. If I were a good boy, I would delete the grass here, but I'm lazy, so I'm not gonna do that. From that angle, they look weird, but if we kind of start rendering, I can see that it starts be looking natural quite quickly, so that area is fine i would like to add more rocks around here but we're kind of running out of out of time and i don't want this tutorial to extend too much i will add one one rock like that indicating that there's there's gonna be more but there's like dirt in there so they're stuck or not stuck, sorry, that they're hidden, hidden, hidden away, hidden away. Like this, let's just double check. Yep, as I expected, they are <laughs> sticking out. So that one moves in. Needs to move in. Nothing is sticking out. Yep, it's going to be fine. Once we add more rocks at later stages, they're, they're going to look great. Okay, so that, that part is done. Now on to, I kind of want to deal with the, gl with the glass. The glass is very dark. So I'm just going to use the picket point or picket tool. Choose the glass, choose the glass, come on. Oh yeah, choose the glass. And for the tint, I will drop uh, or I will increase the tint brightness to be a little bit higher. And for the opacity, I will increase the opacity to up to uh, 60% rather than 50%. Yeah, something like this will will be fine. It's very reflective though. That's fine. Okay, with that done, let's close this. Oh, stop rendering. There we go. We're good. So now on to on to assets that you can have on the terrace and inside of the building itself, right? So in terms of the uh, assets you have the whole library of objects right so it's materials vegeta vegetation now we are going for objects and here you can choose uh, 
you know, amongst different sub libraries, right? And I will go to home um, and I'll go to backyard. Let's go for chairs. Let's just find some sort of a, a anything that might work. And they're very ugly though. Oh no. Okay, let's see chairs. Chairs are a bit better, okay. Hmm. Might use this one. Might use that one. Now I'll just grab that one. Okay, so for the chairs, clearly I need to download it. So I'll just click that little download icon there, right? So these, these little arrows are basically asking you to download things and then I drag and drop it in and it just creates the object for me, right? Hmm. I don't like how it looks, but uh, that's fine. We will find replacements later on or maybe it will not even show up once we, control C, control V, once we render, we'll see. Okay, I just made control C, control V, I, I just made a copy and now we have two of them here. Then the backdrop here, the table, that will not work. That's ugly, oh my God, why are they so bad? <laughs> okay, let's download this one. No, absolutely not. I refuse. Okay, but you, you know how to do it at least, right? So that's the built-in library. And that, that's how you can uh, add stuff for, from the built-in library. For this, I will just find like a collection that might work. Backyard sofa. Sure, why not? Let me just get that one in here. I will just model something out here. I can't, I can't have that in the, in the 3D model. Okay, but uh, yeah, you understand the idea. And then for the interior, the premise is exactly the same. You go to home, let's say living room, you find, I, you know, if, if you find decorations and let's say a frame composition, you know, this one right here, then you can just, it automatically attaches to the wall, right? So it's, it's pretty nice because you can have, uh, you know, the shelved, picture frames or you, you can have the picture frame collection like so and you can always reposition it like that let's say uh, then when it comes down to so that that was decorations right if I go and I find sofas I'll just grab some I will not complain <laughs> I will just grab some random wicks and left sure we're just gonna grab that one in place it right and just rotate 90 degrees even though according to the plan uh, it shouldn't be 90 it should be other way around but it is what it is now we have a sofa and then you know you go and you find a nice coffee table no, those are those are not coffee tables. Daisy, yeah, they, they, Daisy should be okay. Mm. I'll show you soon how you can make your own assets or how you can download assets from the from the internet and not use the assets given to you by Twin Motion. Because while it's kind of nice if you just use the uh, decoration elements and so on and you find a book right and you just place the books on the you know on top of some some sort of a surface yeah that 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 looks great why not but the moment you start dealing with interior like furniture that actual furniture then you need very specific ones and for that you would need to um you know go browse through actual catalogs and try to either model them out or download cat files from the manufacturer's websites um, in terms of 
objects let me just check if i haven't missed anything like the pre uh, premise is exactly the same for everything here right you just find what you're looking for and you just drag and drop drop it in let me go back to the library and just talk about mega scans sketchfab and maybe you have adobe substance 3d maybe you don't but just in case i'll talk about that as well these three right so mega scans uh, there's the 3D assets, 3D plans, surfaces, and uh, decals, decals, right? So if I show you 3D assets and I go building, balcony, here you can see 3D scanned imagery of actual, you know, parts of buildings. And let me find a nicer one. Mm, let's actually go to food, for instance. Fruit. Banana. Let's just get it in here. There it is. Focus in on it. You can see that the quality of this, oops, the quality of this particular asset is leaps and bounds higher than the quality of anything else, right? That's Megascans. Megascans produces extremely high detailed assets. Unfortunately, there's no furniture. Well, there's furniture, but it's like furniture of historic buildings, right? Um, and so on that, that you can use. But um, there are, you know, foods out there that you can just add on the plate and so on. There is some industrial piping and whatnot, if you need it for any reason and and so on, right? Uh, when it comes down to, you know, interior doors, these are the doors that you have, <laughs> interior uh, decorations, that might be something, uh, there might be something there, right? For instance, a rusty teapot. That looks cozy. So let's get that one in. So Megascan's assets are the highest quality uh, assets that you can have in twin motion, period, right? They're really, really great. Unfortunately, very limited in what they, wait, two in what they offer. Right. Also, Megascan's assets, we will come back to this, but they have the uh, nature, the nature tab, and under it, they have the whole embankment, embankment situation where you can have mossy ground. So if you want to build up your ground condition, not from a single surface, but rather from this patches you can and it's it's doable and actually that's how extremely high quality uh, exterior scenes are made they are not built out of single surface but they're built out of these kind of 3d scanned actual patches of nature that you can find in norway for instance or iceland right so that's mega scans sketchfab sketchfab is a little bit uh, i'm back to library sketchfab Sketchfab is uncontrolled and you can get anything in here. But the problem with Sketchfab is that, you know, if I go to architecture, I can just straight up, wait, let's go here. I can straight up download a cathedral. Give me a second, I'll show you. There it is, okay and just drag and drop it in right here. That's a fractal. Oh, that's a fractal cathedral, okay. Is it Minecraft? It might be a Minecraft cathedral. <laughs> Uh, with no textures and whatnot, right? So you're basically downloading weird stuff from the internet that is listed as free, right? Uh, there are some good assets here to be found on Sketchfab, right? And thankfully they are divided up into, you know, into parts or not parts, into uh, types of assets. But even when I choose furniture and home, there's like, a holotech bench billboards room and and, and and so on right so so there's a lot of uh, procedural hong kong building sure there's a lot of like weird weird stuff in here 
the TV looks pretty good though. Monstera Deliciosa potted mid-century. For, for instance, this one looks pretty good. So I'm just going to download it and, and, and see, see if it actually, you know, is a high quality asset. So you can find pretty good ones here, right? So with these three, the built-in library, the Quixel Megascans library, and the Sketchfab library, you basically get a package which should be enough for most of your needs. But if you want to bring your project to the next level, then you either need to create your own assets or you need to browse the catalogs of designers, you know, build, uh, furniture designers and so on, and actually download the models from their websites. And I'll show you how to do that quite, quite soon. Uh, just bear with me for a second. Let's see the Deliciosa plant, Monstera. Okay. I'm not convinced, but maybe. Actually. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, this is a pretty good. Yeah, this is a, a pretty good asset, right? So yeah, uh, you can you can find pretty good ones on Sketchfab as well. Besides that, um, I would suggest first going through the built in library. Uh, there's of course vehicles and characters and like people and so on, everything. Oh, animals. Let's get some, like a cow in here. Um, they work exactly the same way as how you would be placing any other asset, right? So let's not dwell on that too much. Okay, with this done, we're, we're done with the initial portion of the asset placement. And now we're going to move into this more custom portion where I'm going to explain how you can download assets from the internet and place them um, or, or work on them in Rhino and then place them in your scene. So that's going to be the next step. All right. And for part two of this whole asset workflow, let's talk about importing of custom assets that you find on the internet or you model model yourselves, right? So before we move on, let me just turn off the painted vegetation because it's just too, it's too heavy, right? And that's, that's good enough. And for some reason I have some measure tools here. Let me delete those. There we go. Right. And now we move on to Rhino. Right, because we will be creating a custom asset in Rhino. So in this case, this is a completely empty Rhino file and I'm just going to make a cube, right? From zero and we're dealing with millimeters. You can check here in the bottom. Um, I'm drawing in millimeters. So I'm gonna do a thousand by a thousand by a thousand cube, right? And then I'll apply a quick box mapping to it just so that we are, there we go. Just a box map on top of it, a thousand millimeters in each direction, right? So the textures will tile on this cube um, once every one meter. I will select this cube and I will export it. Export. And I'll export it into my Twin Motion Course um, folder. And I'll, I, you know, just arbitrary folder that I have on my desktop. And I'll name it Cube. And I will choose a f extension or type type of the file to be FBX, which is going to be motion builder. It should start with M. There we go. Motion builder dot FBX. This file type is used to export most of like, geometries between different software packages, as long as the geometries are meshes and the meshing of the cube will happen behind the scenes, so to say. Right, so if you're exporting to any rendering software, usually you do use FBX or you use plugins such as Datasmith, right, to actually synchronize your CAD files. In this case, we're using, you know, a raw export format, FBX. Okay, I'll hit save. It gives me the meshing options for the, the cube. Honestly, uh, maybe you will see the simple controls, something like this just have more polygons that's fine it's not going to create a crazy amount of polygons on the box you can hit preview to see you know how many like squares and triangles it makes to approximate the geometry this looks absolutely fine if you don't know what's the difference between a mesh and a poly surfaces 
uh, then I suggest just Googling for, for it, mesh versus NURBS or something like that, and you'll figure it out. But basically, it's just rebuilding the whole geometry made out of triangles and squares, right? We hit OK, and it just exports. You might end up having an additional menu box such as this, right? It, it might ask you additional things. So you export meshes only, uh, materials as fun, it doesn't matter. And then map Rhino Z to FBXY. Usually this is um, this needs to be done, but we will we will check. We will double check if this is correct, right? So these are the settings that I'm using, right, to export. And then in Twin Motion we go to Import, click the little plus sign, Geometry here in the top, open the file, find the cube, dot FBX, hit Open. Here it has all of the different settings for it. Let's see, keep hierarchy, we don't care for, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Up axis, automatic, unit conversion, automatic. Let's try everything on auto, see if that works. Import, now we have our cube. I wonder where it is. Let's try to find it, there we go. So it creates a new folder here in our scene rollout. That says cube.fbx, if I expand it, then it gives me the object one, right, in, in that folder, which is our cube. And it is in the correct size, right? And now another test, if I take, let's say, stones material and I just apply, yeah, the stones material on this, it styles quite, quite well, right? So the texture mapping also transfers. So basically the settings that we use and, and so on, like ev everything works and everything works great. So with this test done with a cube, now we're ready to make something a little bit more fancy, right? So I'm just going to delete the cube FBX from here, from the imports, we don't need it. You can see, by the way, that my Rhino uh, link is broken with this icon right here. That's because I'm using a different Rhino file right now. So it's complaining, but not really complaining. It's just telling me that synchronization will not, not work, which is fine. Right. So now on to getting assets from the internet. So there are two websites that I'm going to show you. First one is called Polyhaven and Polyhaven basically hosts a bunch of free assets that you can download and use on your, on your projects. Right. And they have uh, three different categories, HDRIs, textures, and models. And I will cover HDRIs and textures in further chapters of, of this course, but now we're going to focus on the models, right? So if I click on browse models, you can see all of the different types of assets that you can, uh, that you can use. One thing to note is the trees in Polyhaven are extremely complex and getting them from like a state in which they are in right here uh, into Twin Motion would require you to go through a different kind of software that's called Blender. I already tried it and the trees do use portions of uh, geometry that is only available uh, through Blender. So you would need to do a specific export of that. Besides that, uh, all of the rocks and so on, all of these are uh, free to use, right? So for example, let's find some boulder or some rock that I like, or for instance, these guys, rock moss set, right? Let me just double check. What do we have here? These seem to be separate, but at the same, not separate. Okay, this should work. All right, sorry, apologies for that. But once you click on any kind of an asset library, uh, thing or any asset, you're presented with its preview, right? So here you can choose to look at the 3D version of the asset and then you can rotate around it. Let's make it full screen even. Rotate around it, see if the quality is, is fine, if, you know, and so on. Uh, most of the rock assets we're going to just use from Quixel Megascans because those are also great, but if you need something kind of specific uh, that only Polyhaven has, sure, you can just download them. And I'll, I'll be downloading them just to show you how it works. Here um, you have in the top right corner, you have how detailed should the texture be of the rocks. And in this case, we have um, 1K, 2K, 4K, 8K. Think of it this way. It's how many pixels there are in X and Y uh, coordinate of each 
image, right? So 4K would be 4096 by 4096, 2K 2048 by 2048, 1K 1024, 1024, right? And if I click on this, that's the image or those are the textures that are used to dress up these models, right? So of course, the larger the image, the more detail you will have, but the heavier the file is going to be. So in this case, I'm going to use 2K textures because these are just rocks that are going to be in the back background somewhere, right? So that's fine. And then right next to it is what kind of a format should you use? And we use FBX, of course. So I'm going to choose that. I hit download. I wait for it to do its magic. Let me go to my downloads folder right here. There we go. Extract it, open it up, and here we will have FBX format, uh, the, the 3D file, as well as its accompanying textures. And for some reason, only three textures. What's up with that? Normal, GL, one second, roughness, diffuse, diffuse, roughness, normal. Yeah, that's fine. That's all we need. What What's this one, though? I like this one. If we need it, we will download this separately, but I don't think we do. So for now, um, I can actually now import the rocks directly in um, Twin Motion without really using Rhino for, for that. I can just click on the plus sign, hit open, navigate to where my downloaded FBX file is, hit open, um, agree to the settings, import. And then my rocks should be somewhere here. There we go, there they are, right? And they are indeed, since we're keeping the hierarchy, they are indeed separate rock entities. And notice how it's smart about the texturing. It already has the textures kind of locked in or, or um, these, these rocks already have textures applied to them because it's read from the folder of the textures. If I use the pipette tool and click on the rock, here I can see what it's using. And I can see that for roughness, it's not actually using the roughness texture. Or, the, or is it open? And I can go in here to my downloads, textures, the roughness texture. I will do a completely different uh, chapter for the texture mapping and, or sorry, material creation and so on. So this is gonna be a much faster one. So that's roughness and then I will find normals, normal map, open. Really, it, it's unable to do EXR normals. Okay, well that sucks. But that's, uh, we will need I guess we will need a separate, yeah, this is gonna be covered in the separate chapter. But basically, that's that's how it goes, right? The You just drag and drop in the rocks and then from there on out, you can just copy them around and so on. Also, what you can do is you can select the rocks that you have imported, like every single individual rock, and you can create, uh, you can add it to your own library, to the user li library, right? So for instance, this rock, right, I can just click on the three little dots here, add to user library. And then if I go to library, user library, there's my rock that I can just, you know, from here on out use as I wish. And I can even scatter stuff with it. So for instance, mm, populate, uh, foliage, paint on with this rock. <laughs> well, the density is a little bit a little bit too much, right? So let's reduce the density from it. But you get get what I mean, right? So you can you can use the assets this way to create a rocky uh, rocky surface, right? And this is a single rock, so it's it's kind of boring. But actually, you could use those six rocks to create a pretty interesting landscape by just painting it on. So that's uh, that's how it works. Let me delete that. Uh, that import, we don't need these rocks for now. So I'm going to delete the whole thing here. Right. Next up is a thing that I prefer to use uh, when importing stuff. It's downloading uh, things from designer collections, right? So for in this case, I'm going to use ariakiacollection.com. 
a Japanese brand that does wooden furniture mostly. And here, if I click on these three little dashes in the top right corner, I can go to products and I can scroll through their collection to find stuff that I like. So for example, hmm, it's just fun. oh, that, that's that's a nice sofa. Okay, sure. I'm, I'm gonna use this sofa. I just hope that they have a cat file. Yep, they have a cat file for it, right? So this sofa right here, you know, has the whole whole thing. There's probably somewhere pricing of it as well. No, there's no pricing, doesn't matter. Um, we just click on the CAD, right? To download the CAD file. It's very fast, Raft Sofa. There we go, it's in my downloads now. I unzip it. Make sure to unzip things so that they work. And here we have the 3DS files. Okay, 3DS files, uh, I believe they still work for as a direct import um, in Twin Motion, Raft Sofa. Like that open import, yeah, they work. But you can see that uh, we have a few problems with 3ds files. First one being the size of the thing, right? It's it's way too big, right? And there's no textures and then whatnot. Usually you don't get textures with your 3D models that you download from manufacturers' websites because they also use CAD software and it's just geometry, right? So we will need to go through our Rhino file to first clean them up, make sure that the size is correct and so on, right? So in my Rhino file, I'll just go for the wrapped sofa. There we go. And I will bring both of them in because I can see that there's two of them. So first I'll bring in SST import file. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Rhino units are in millimeters. Yeah, we should scale it. And note it, remember this is one meter, right? High, and so the sofa is way too big. It's probably 10 times too big. So I'll just scale the sofa by 0 0.1. Hmm, that feels, no, that, that, that seems okay because if this is one meter, then this is around 60 centimeters and that's that's enough for seating. Yeah, okay. So that's that's our sofa. Now if I go into shaded view, this is how it looks like. You can see that it's basically meshed. Uh, it, it, it's a mesh, right? If I change this to Arctic view, you can see that it's pretty clean, right? The design of it is, is pretty clean, but there are going to be issues and problems, specifically these kind of jagged lines. So first thing that you do to clean a CAD file that you have downloaded from the internet is you clean up the jagged the jaggedness of the shading. I really hope that it shows, right, how, how messed up this is. So you select the mesh that is messed up and you type in weld, especially for all soft meshes, right, such as a pillow. Weld and weld tolerance, you just choose 360. All right, and then you need to do one more thing is it's called remove crease, right? So for all of the soft edges that we have here, I will isolate, select these, remove crease, select the, all of it again, drag around it, and it's going to remove the creases. Now, if I look at it in Arctic view, you can see that it's much softer. It still messes up in the corners, but not as much. There are ways of how to make it even softer, but we will not be doing those. Mm. Or should I show you? I can show you because why not, right? So I will just show it on one pillow. So this guy right here, the issue that we have with it is that it's all, um, the, these, these triangles are overkill and also it still has some creases in there. Is this a crease? Yes, it is. What the hell? Okay, we try again. So apologies for that. Remove crease, select everything, remove. What the hell? Okay, that, that's weird. So you need to specifically select the edges. Oh, but then it, this one pops in. Okay, there's uh, there are issues with this mesh. We ignore it. Instead, we will use quad remesh on it, quad remesh, with target count of, well, let's say 2000, sure, 2000. Hit preview, 
delete input objects, hide input objects, and this is the output mesh that you get, a much, much softer version of this and much cleaner version. 2000 seems to be doing just fine, so I'll hit OK. This one as well. Forgot to delete the original, right? I think we're losing the edge here, so I'm going to give it a little bit more of a push with 3000 target polygon count. Preview, a hide, adaptive size 80%. Hmm, that's annoying. <laughs> 4,000, why not? Oh yeah, okay, that, that's close enough. That's, that's fine. And then just delete that, right? So this has a little bit more detail in it. Then quad remesh this one, 4,000 should be enough. Yeah? Delete input objects, and this one, the last one. Okay. So now these uh, these pillows and uh, soft bodies will have much, I mean, they, they will be much, much smoother, right? Uh, once we start adding materials on top of them. Then in terms of actually adding materials on top of this, uh, that intersection is na nasty. Um, in, in terms of adding materials, you need to choose which which ones are gonna be which, and for that you reference the manufacturer's website, right? So this one is gonna be not that, but rather with a table, this, right? So it's the same wood used for the whole framing here and the same uh, material used for the uh, cushions, right? So it's gonna be two materials. I'm going to make two layers. One layer is gonna be called fabric. The other layer is gonna be called wood. Right, and for fabric, I'm just bringing in these elements, change object layer, there we go. And for wood, I'm doing exactly the same thing. Should that be metal? Mm, probably not, probably wood as well. Okay, in terms of wood, that's going to be very easy to deal with. We just do, uh, in terms of texturing, uh, the, the wood, portion of this furniture. We just do texture mapping, box, uh, bounding box, enter, 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 and we lock it to, uh, this is in millimeters, so one meter, 1000, 1000, 1000. That's done. And then in terms of the cushions, that's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, if I were to do box mapping, let's just see, um, let's just see if that's going to work. Box map, lock every um, one meter and then let's actually check the uv map of them use texture um, in these areas right here there's going to be you know a weird blend between you know, the three directions at which the box projection attacks uh, your, your, your mesh, right? So the corners are always messing up, rounded corners always mess up when you do box mapping on soft bodies. But honestly, as long as we use a pretty calm texture, and this one seems to be pretty calm, uh, we don't really need to deal too much with the, the, the messiness, right? Oh, sorry, uh, we, we won't need to deal too much with the seams. So I think this is going to be fine. Um, if this doesn't work, right, then we would need to do um, custom UV unwrap, and we would need to specify the seams at which, you know, this whole geometry is being unfolded. And I, I already showed you how to do that. So I'm not going to show you again. All right. So now if I select this whole shape, oh yeah, don't forget to actually give it different colors, orange and wood can be black, uh, synchronize, render colors, that's important. Wait, synchronize all, uh, all, all layers. And then we delete this. We don't need the cube anymore. And let me just show you one, one thing. I'll dra drag this away from the 000 coordinate and I'll just select it, type in export and I'll export it as my sofa one. Save. 
right? It's exported. Then here I'm going to click uh, the import key. I'm gonna navigate to where my furniture actually is. Sofa one, open, import. Material name at three, material conflict. Uh, for the conflict use uh, imported material or keep both. I'll, I'll choose to keep both because there already exists mat material three from Rhino file. So you always choose keep both. Apply to all, hit okay. Right. Then we need to figure out where our sofa is. There it is, right? Imports just like that. And then if I select it, you can see <clears throat> a weird thing that its origin point, right? And the point around which it rotates is really funky, really weird, right? And that is because here I purposely moved it away from 000, zero, zero coordinate so that you can see that it's messy, right? So what we can do is we can select this and instead of just typing in export, we can type in export, oh, I'm sorry, export with origin. With origin, insertion base point, and you then specify what is the origin for this sofa. So I'm going to specify, let's see this point right here with vertex snap turned on, of course, just like that. And I'm just going to overwrite my sofa one, yes. And now in here, I can just click on this refresh button because we overwrote the FBX file, refresh. And now my sofa is actually gonna be, where is it? There it is. My sofa is actually now exported right here. Easy peasy. Then for this uh, file, or not file, but rather for, for this, uh, import for this geometry, I'll apply some materials, of course. Oh, there's a lot that have been created during our testing. So we can just use the purge tool right here to clean them up. Still quite, quite a few. I wonder why there's mat one, mat zero. Oh no, did it create one material per each element? Yeah, it did, it did. Okay, so let me, if, if you have this problem, let me show you how to troubleshoot it. So. We have four different orange materials for four different pieces of geometry here. Means that something's off in Rhino. If I go into Rhino and I select these objects, go to their material, you can see that here mat zero is selected, mat one, mat two, mat three, right? So they all have individual materials. What you do to fix this is you select the whole, or all of the geometry, and instead of different materials, you choose use layer material. Right? Then you purge, type in purge, uh, make sure that materials is turned to yes, and just hit enter. It's going to remove all of the geometry that you don't need, right? Then we select this again, export with origin, base point again, this point right here, sofa one, you know, we overwrite it and here under import, we just click the little refresh button to re-import it. Now under materials, if I purge this, now we only have two materials here, right? So that, that's, that's how it operates. Now let's actually replace these materials. So let me go to library, materials, fabric, 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 there we go. Uh, that's carpet, definitely not carpet, definitely not velvet. Da, 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 da. Those are kind of fine woven, maybe that. Oh, these need to be downloaded, okay. Let me just download the woven one. I'm going to double check the brand. brand. Um, actually, this one is closer, so I'm gonna download this one instead. Come on, there it is, drag and drop it in. Yeah, that's not too bad, but you can see how messy the seams get. So I might end up needing to un unwrap this, right? But for now we can uh, still uh, adjust the materials and make sure that they, they, they work nice, right? So that's that's fine, that's okay. And then uh, for the furniture, I'm, I'm just going to use, or sorry, for the wood, I'm just going to use a specific 
wood they should have what do they use they don't use oak it's not plywood give me a sec okay i don't find uh, i can't find any woods that would fit here so i'm going to go to materials or sorry library mega scans surfaces uh maybe fab oh, not fabric sorry wood 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 because there's much more here, right? Wood, veneer, and let's just find ash, perhaps. Ash seems like it's it's gonna gonna work, so I'm gonna use ash. Let's download it, drag and drop it in. Wait for it to calculate. That's how it looks. Of course, we need the tiling not to be like that. Also, it's very intense. Is there like a cedar? Let's try cedar. Yeah, that's better actually. Okay, we're, we're gonna be using cedar for this. And one by one meter seems to be okay for the tiling of cedar wood. And then for fabric, I think I might under plane. That's cotton furniture fabric. I'm just gonna use some plain furniture fabric because this is too intense with its grain and so on. So I'm just gonna use that instead. This almost hides it fine, almost, but I, I kinda want to fix it. So I'm gonna do a quick time lapse of me UV unwrapping these two to actually fix them. One second. Okay, it's done. So now we have, I also imported another table because I liked the, the design, Sp specifically th these areas, quite, quite like them. So I imported this as well. Um, we'll we're going to use it as our, our kitchen table. So here now we could just start moving things around, but what I want to do is I want to use this perhaps in my future projects and I don't want to be bothered with, uh, rhino and, and you know do, doing the same uv and wrapping and blah 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 so i'm going to make these into my um, scene materials or sorry uh, user objects user library objects yes user library objects right so i'm going to select uh, table one this guy right here the whole folder the whole damn folder click on the three little dots here and choose to add to user library. And now it's here, right? And if I were to just drag it drag it in, you can see that it's you know available. If I click on it uh, with the pipette tool, I can change its material, you know, and, and so on. So it's uh, right now it becomes an asset that you can use in your in your file. So it's not like one off thing anymore. And you can use it anytime you want. And I forgot that I need to delete this <laughs> second. Let's delete it like that. Okay. So that's uh, table one. And then the same thing goes for the sofa. Add user library. There we go. Sofa one. It's right there. The icons are not the best, but uh, as long as you know the names of them, or you can, I think, rename. Yeah, you can rename them. So I can just say... A React table, a React sofa, and that's it, right? 
Now I can just drag and drop in the sofa as I please. I'll go back to the import, click on th three dots here and just choose to delete these, these two imports. And also I'll just delete everything from the scene here that, you know, the tables or sofas, because as I need to, I will just kind of get them in here. So this sofa can leave and instead we will use the Ariake sofa, which is much smaller. But at the same time, it's kind of cute. It's kind of nice like that and just drag it around and find, find a place for it. Right. And then for the table, bam, rotate 90 degrees. Hmm. Doesn't really fit in, in here. So I'm thinking this goes away. The whole sofa situation needs to be somewhere here. I, I should open up the plans <laughs> to to actually see uh, how we plan out, uh, how we planned this building out. But if I remember correctly, the kitchen table was somewhere here. The dining dining table was somewhere here, surrounded by um, chairs, and then the sofa with a coffee table here with. Uh, TV stand there. So that should be fine. And the, we had a kitchen island here, but I will not be adding that in, right? So that's that's the basic premise of how you import things. I will not be doing every, I will not be importing every single a asset here. Uh, I just wanted to show you, um, you know, ju just the logic of it. Hopefully that, that makes sense. So now I think we're kind of done with the asset portion of this um, of this video, of this tutorial. So we move on to the next one, uh, to the next chapter. And in between the two, I will be just adding in assets and populating the, the scene so that it looks a little bit more lively. So it's going to, well, you'll see a little bit more of an updated version. I might do a really quick time lapse for it as well. We, we'll see, we'll see. But on to the next chapter. All right, let's talk about material creation and editing. And before we begin, I'll just show you a few things that I've done. Uh, first one being I've added in this, I don't know, how do you pit the conversation pit in the terrace? I think it's it looks a little bit better, a little bit more 
integrated con compared to having sofas and so on on top of the terrace. So that's the first thing. Uh, second thing is I ended up modeling out the kitchen island, right, right here. And of course, there's some some assets that I have placed, but you've seen that in the um, time lapse. In the time lapse. All right. So now, in terms of materials, let's create. I, I kind of want to create some sort of a, let's go to objects, primitives, and let's just do a box or chamfer box. Drag that one in here, somewhere here, uh, anywhere, honestly, and just have it floating about, right? This is going to be our test subject, right? We're going to be adding materials to this. <clears throat> so first of all, how do you create a material? Oh, let's purge the uh, unnecessary ones. So to create a material, just click on this little plus sign here and it adds a standard material. Then you can rename it, of course, and you can name it as uh, my first material, for instance, right? And Twinmotion uses the PBR workflow. PBR stands for physics-based rendering, meaning that all of the materials that are used in Twinmotion are accurate, physic are physically accurate. The key points of any default material are, or key inputs are the diffuse color, which is right here. It's under color where you can change the, oh yeah, I forgot to drag it on where you can change, actually change the color of the material, right? And then there's the, I'll, I'll talk about luminosity and so on a little bit later for now. Let's keep it as it is. Uh, then you have the roughness which is basically how reflective the material is. Look at the top of the cube, right? like that. That's zero roughness, that's full roughness, right? Then you have metalness. So let's tone down the roughness to 0% and then let's increase the meta how metallic it is to 100%. See, now we have a metallic cube. And then there is the normals. Normals are basically can we get, I'll, I'll talk about normals once we start importing textures. For now, I'm just introducing stuff to you. Normals are um, texture-based inconsistencies or, or bumps in your texture. For example, if I were to check the normals of this particular, the slate stone tiles texture that I have here, expand the details and just open, oh, not open, sorry. Uh, is there an easy way to... Okay, I'll, I'll just show it here. You can see this purple texture. Basically, it describes... This texture describes at what angle each pixel on the surface is looking at, facing at. And in doing so, you can specify that, you know, certain things are higher than other things because they're looking at different angles, right? So in terms of these bricks, all of the purple stuff right here is just the completely vertical vector. And then the more cyan, the cyan, the more cyan it gets, uh, the more it's looking towards the north, the more red it gets, the more it's looking towards the south, right? And also, of course, there's left and right, the green and the yellow, I guess. I don't remember how it's encoded, but basically this is the, the normal map and it defines the, uh, the textures. I can actually copy this normal map from here from the slate texture. And let me go back to my first uh, metal or my first material. And here under normal, under details for the normal map, I'll click on the little icon here and choose to paste. See? And now this only has the normal map uh, of the slate texture. It doesn't change the the surface, right? So there's no additional polygons or additional geometry that's created here. It's only the way uh, of how the material reflects the surrounding environment, right? Uh, that creates this illusion. It's very, very, a very powerful type of a texture. I'll talk about it a little bit later on, right? Besides these, uh, these guys, we have the emissive. Emissive is basically how much does it glow? You can see that as uh, as I'm increasing the luminance, the camera kind of adapts to the luminance and everything else becomes darker, right? 
So that's in knits. Uh, we will not have this glowing. That, that would be weird. Then you have the mask. Um, so basically you can use black or white uh, texture to carve out areas uh, out of the um, out of the material. Um, I could use, or rather, uh, this is quite niche, so I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later. But basically, you can make holes in your material with a texture that is that has white and black spots. We'll cover this later. X-ray basically just makes it transparent, right? Or translucent, I guess. This is a troubleshooting or debugging material, so you don't really need to use it. Oh, let me turn it off. Or material setting, I guess. And under miscellaneous, there's the two-sided option. For example, uh, this material right here of this object, let me take the pipette tool, select it. Still trying to do that. Okay, let's try again. It's weird, I can't select it for some reason. Maybe I need to do that from here. There we go. Okay, concrete one, right? Has two-sided material applied to it. Uh, two-sided option applied to it. Meaning that doesn't matter from which side I'm looking at this particular area and this particular material uh, object, I'm going to see it. If I have this two-sided turned off, you can see that from this side, it's see-through while from here I can still see it, right? And that's because my object has zero thickness, right? So what what it does, it here it has a backside of the surface, thus you cannot see it. So two-sided material helps me make sure that it works, right? And then we have the weather option. Basically when you later down the line, once we describe that it's raining, or I can show you now, you know, if it's raining in your scene, then uh, the materials that have the weather option will react to the rain. Typically you have them turned on, right? Back to here. Oh yeah, and that's, that's basically it, right? So these are very um, simple, right? Very, uh, the material creation in uh, Twinmotion is pretty simplistic. You need the color, you need uh, the roughness, you need uh, the metallic, right? Those three. And then you need the normals. I forgot the normals. So usually the metallic, uh, the metalness of an object is either 100% or 0%. <clears throat> there are very few materials that have 50% metallicness, right? Usually it's either metal or it's not metal, right? In terms of roughness, it can go, you know, it, it's, it's a full range. So let me actually show you. Uh, how you can create a material by oh, yeah, and I forgot the Additional details and so on, but we will we will get to that once we actually start Creating like a proper material. So first of all, let me remove the normal map from here right click or sorry left click mm, Default there we go defaults out the normal map is gone and then let's change the color or color can stay pink that's fine that's fine we can we can have a pink color let's download some textures so polyhaven right not hdris though uh the textures so from polyhaven you can download a bunch of kind of cool textures that you know you might be missing in twin motion and i use this a lot i use this uh texture browser or not texture browser, the website quite, quite a bit. And let's just find some uh, arbitrary, some not, well, we use wood a lot, don't we? Let's go for something spicier, thatched roof, right? This kind of a, this kind of a texture. Uh, clearly there's more than just, um, sorry, clearly there's more than just color information here. There's also uh, displacement information and there's there's also normal map information right and reflectiveness and then so on so the, the, it has a lot of materials but unfortunately for twin motion we don't really um, need all of them or can use all of them that's the you know the, that's where the limitations of twin motion start showing right so before you click download 
you do need to expand this uh, option for what kind of textures are you going to be downloading and you just need to choose uh, diffuse normal I don't remember if it's using DirectX or OpenGL normal map, so we will download both of them and we will just see. R and roughness. Oh, that's actually great. They, yeah, <laughs> we just use that. Diffuse, two normals and roughness. Hit the download, it's 55 megabytes. It's a big texture, but should do the trick, right? Give it a second. All right, that's done. Then, Okay, close that and close that. <laughs> then I have my textures right here, four of them. And you can see, let, let's just go quickly go through them. That's the image texture. If I zoom into it, you can see the quality with which we're dealing, right? That's pretty high quality, 4K. Then we have the roughness map. So the white stuff is gonna be very rough, non-reflective at all. And the dark stuff is, yeah, uh, the dark stuff is going to be less rough, meaning more reflective, right? So what it's basically, uh, just by looking at the roughness map, I can tell <clears throat> that it's going to be looking a little bit wet. You know, it's going to have a little bit of a sheen because the high spots will be uh, darker. And then we have the two normal maps. First one here, second one here, right? Why two? Because some programs use the direct x normal maps normal maps that are made for direct x and other programs use normal maps that are made for opengl these are two standards basically and depending on the program you choose whichever you need do i know which one twin motion uses no i don't but i'll show you how to figure it out so we go back into uh, twin motion and for uh, we do, we ignore the color or rather for the color i'll use some you know middle gray tone and instead we immediately jump into normal the normal map right expand the details and click on the little icon there and hit open navigate to where you have your uh, material downloaded and choose whichever uh, normal map you want doesn't matter choose randomly hit open and look if it looks weird or not. And for me, this looks pretty good. I'll, I'll switch to open. I'll switch to the other one. Hmm. And the other one does not look as good. It looks almost inverted, right? So I'm going to guess that um, Twin Motion does use direct X normal maps, not OpenGL. So nor DX 4K. Open that. Okay. So normal map is done. Nothing really to uh, to do there. You can decrease the intensity of it or keep it at a hundred percent. I usually always keep them at a hundred percent. Then the metalness, of course, thatched roof is not metallic, so metalness is zero. That's easy. Um, and then we have the roughness. Roughness is also going to be, I think I can just drag and drop it in, right? Let's just see if that's that's gonna have uh, that's gonna work. Textures, um, roughness, drag and drop it in. I can't. Okay, that's that's yucky. Okay, we do need to go through open roughness. Bam. Give it a second. Wait, does it need to be a hundred percent? Yes, it does. Okay. Let me just make sure that this, this thing works. Default it. Open again. Yeah, okay, okay, it, it, it does work, thank God. Okay, it does work. So we have our uh, roughness texture set. And then the last one is indeed the actual thatched roof. Um, the, the, the colors, so I will just choose, instead of a color, I'll go to details and here I will choose a uh, texture. Open that, thatched roofed angle, open, bam, there it is. Right? Okay, so 
now let's talk about uh, other settings that you can uh, change. First of all, let me change the UV scale to be 0.5 or, or sorry, yes, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so that it tiles more on this cube so that I can see better what the hell is going on. Maybe even 0 0.25. Yeah, I just want it to look, uh, to look quite natural, right? And once you're starting to deal with very kind of precise adjustments of the texture, then usually you do turn on the path tracer because you want to make sure that, you know, the colors and so on that you change are going to be, you know, correct in the path tracer. Usually I change things and I double keep checking in the path tracer. I don't have it on all the time. It's very blue, isn't it? The shadows, I mean, uh, we're going to fix that later. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, additional settings. Under color, there's grunge. If I were to move here, I can increase the grunge and hopefully you can see what happens, right? This is 100% grunge. This is no grunge. 100% no grunge, right? Is there anywhere where I can show you better? Well, it's, it's basically dirt. You're just adding dirt to, to this. And it's quite useful to break apart the tiling of the material, right? So I usually have grunge at like 50% for most of the stuff that I do, except for the interior, because that should stay kind of clean. Then we have the luminosity, right? You can see in the preview, if the luminosity is set to zero, it's basically black. If luminosity is set to 100%, it's over bright. It's not um, 100%, uh, sorry, it doesn't become white, but it becomes brighter than it should be. 50% is like regular, like luminosity, right? And then under details, you can change the texture uh, parameters as well. It's like built-in small Photoshop. You can increase the saturation or decrease the saturation, right? You can lift the gamma or tone down the gamma, right? Lift is just adding in white or black, right? Gamma is like contrast and, and gain is... Uh, lift and gain are basically the same thing, honestly. Yeah, I can't be bothered to explain that. It's, it's all brightness oriented, right? It's just the way of how you can um, control the brightness. So the, usually I don't touch these because it's very easy to mess things up. So usually I just keep them uh, as, you know, at, at a default one and then saturation here. That's going to be one. Okay. So that's messing around with, with the color here. <clears throat> then for the UVs, we already have worked on UVs quite a bit, so you understand how they work, hopefully. There's, of course, the more settings here. Um, I guess offset and the stretch, that makes sense, you know, so you can make the material stretched on in one side more than, than the other, and so on, along one direction, sorry. Uh, the offset is where does the material start from, where does it end, so you can offset the material to align, the, just like I aligned the seams here in the roof. And then you have the speed. The speed only works on like grass blades and so on that are shimmering in the wind. So you don't really need to deal with the speed right now. Then for the roughness map, that's exactly the same thing. I will not uh, um, not talk on it a little bit, uh, uh, not talk on it too much. But sometimes you don't have a roughness map. Instead, you have a glossiness map. Glossiness is an inverse or reflectivity map. It's inverse of roughness, you can still use that in uh, Twin Motion, but all you would need to do then is to click on the Invert tool, right? In this case, I will not be able to fish out a material that has a glossiness map, but if you see a map that's called glossiness, you can still use it as roughness map, but it needs to be inverted, right? Okay. Right. Then, the metalness, you know, that's the, exactly the same thing as, as the roughness. You know, you, you work exactly the same th way with it as if you were working with roughness. We can make this metallic, but let's not. And then for the normal map, uh, we have decided or figured out that it's actually open. Uh, not OpenGL, sorry, it's the other one, the DirectX uh, normal maps that Twinmotion is using. 
for emissive, um, you can add a texture as an emissive material, or you can um, just use a color, right? I'll, I'll show you emissive materials once we get to the lights uh, portion of the video. And for masks, <clears throat> I kind of want to show you some opacity map just so that we're uh, so just so, so that it's clear. Uh, let me just find uh, under materials what would have. Uh, I guess mm, here perforated dots. Perfect. The, the, I, I think perforations will have a mask that drives the holes in the perforated uh, metal. So let's just wait for it to download. There we go. I'll just borrow it. There it is. I can just drag and drop it in to show you. See the holes. Now, if I show you the mask of this, uh, pipette tool, um, are you kidding me? Oh, there is. Oh, that's weird. Uh, one second. It's going to be using something else, right? Details, texture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, they're, they're doing, uh, <clears throat> Apologies. They're doing a fancy thing where they're using a PNG file with transparency information as their uh, color information and then using that transparency information as their uh, mask, which sucks because I can't show it to you this way. So instead, what I'm going to do is draw something in paint. Brush. Oh, that's need a bigger for there we go one eye second eye and uh, not a smiley face because I hoped that the perforations will work I uh, save that to my desktop just PNG file regular PNG file drag on my first material again <clears throat> and here I will choose to use the opacity map and for the map, I will open my masterpiece that I have here. And the tiling of it is way off <laughs> immediately. I think we can... Wait, I can invert it. No, I shouldn't. So let me just mess around with the rotation and the scale of things. There we go. Since the scale is smaller, now, now you, can, you can actually see it. I can make it even smaller so that you can see more of them. But now I have this as a cutout, right? So that, that's how you use a mask. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> and of course I can use um, an inverted version of this so that we just have the floating uh, smiley faces. Well, awkward smiley faces, right? Two-sided on. So that's, that's masks. Um, these are mostly used for tree leaves. Right, so that you can have a rectangle defining geometrically defining a leaf, but then you use a mask to cut out the actual shape of the leaf. It's a great optimization for uh, the preview, right? For for shading. That's it. Those are the materials. So now, uh, before we move into lighting, <clears throat> lighting of the scene and uh, all the ways of how you can light the scene, um, I'm going to create a custom object that we will use in the next step. So follow along with me, right? I'm, I'm going to delete the cube though, and actually purge the purge out that thatched roof material. And instead I am going to go to libraries, tools, not tools, sorry, libraries, objects, primitives, and I'm going to grab a sphere that is one meter large, right? This sphere right here. And for this sphere, I'm going to make it smaller, so I'm going to scale it. Um, easiest way to do that is just to click XYZ in the bottom right corner. And for the scale, just type in 50% in all three directions. You know, half a meter sphere. Maybe even smaller. Well, no, half a meter is fine. So that's going to be one sphere. Then holding the shift key, I'm going to drag it up. Hold the shift key, drag it up and make copies of it. How many copies? Uh, three, one, two, three, like that. 
So you should have four spheres aligned like so, right? Once this is done, we will create a new standard material, rename this to white, duplicate, rename the duplicated one to gray or mid gray. Duplicate again, rename black. This is important, by the way, uh, just, just so that you know. And duplicate again and rename to reflective. Uh, reflection is fine as well, right? Then the white material, I will not have a color set to it to be pure white. No, no, no. The white material, the snow white, you know, as, as bright, as white as pure snow, is going to be 85% uh, white on, on the way towards white. So if I take a calculator, 255 times 0 0.85, that is 216.75, so 217. And that is going to be 217 for R, 217 for G, 217 for B. There we go. That is the whiteness of snow, right? Then for the mid gray, or rather let's do black instead, right? And apply white material, I, I'll, I'll just get it on the top here. Then for, let's, let's do the black material. Black material, the brightness of the coal, of coal is 4%, so 0 0.04 um, albedo color, meaning, uh, 255 times 0 0.04, 10.2. Uh, we're gonna do 10. So color of the black is going to be 10, 10, 10, right? And I'm just going to have it perhaps, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's have it here in the um, third one from the top. So that's white, that's black. Middle gray, this is gonna be weird. It's color theory, so color theory is really weird. It's 18% of the way there, right? So if I do, it's not 50%, right? So if I do 255 times 0 0.18, 45.9, 46. 46 for red channel, 46 for green channel, 46 for blue channel. That is middle gray right and then the last one is going to be reflective so it can stay as white color but it's going to have roughness set to zero and also it's going to have metallic metalness set to a hundred percent so that is just a mirror mirror sphere that we have here you can see that it's struggling with reflections here but if i turn on the path tracer it's it's fine it, it works right all right, so now we have ourselves um, four, four spheres in the scene, holding the control key, I can select all four of them that have um, these, these assets, uh, how do I see, uh, give me a second, that we can use to check the brightness values on any scene as we render them, uh, render it out, right, to balance our light this is very important so i'm going uh, i have selected all four of them i'm going to right click and choose to move to a new container and i'll call this light check light check container right and now i'm going to click on the three little dots for my light check container and i'll choose to um, add to user library it's useful uh, let's just have it in our library so next time we need it we just drag and drop it in and actually I don't need it right now so I'm going to delete the spheres from the uh, from the scene right purge that <clears throat> we're good to go so we are done with the materials that's as simple as it gets to adjust materials of existing um, objects for instance this one let's say you know I'm, I'm looking at it it's way too reflective no worry you just take a 
picket tool, start rendering, go into the roughness, not roughness, sorry. Where is it? Where is it? Go into the opacity. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that there's also uh, for glass, you also have the opacity rollout. So you can go in here and just tone down the opacity to, well, not 0%, but like 25%, right? <clears throat> and now it's not as reflective. You can see more on the inside, right? Uh, there's all, also Fresnel opacity, which is basically depending on the angle at which you're looking at, it's going to have uh, different reflective values. So you can see that at uh, the far end, it's ref more reflective than on the near end. Um, usually, like there are instances where materials behave that way, but uh, we don't, no, 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 no. So we, we stick to Fresnel opacity of zero. All right, new chapter. Let's talk about cameras, how you can add them, how you can edit them and what are they used for. So to add a camera to your scene from which you will be rendering out either static images or animations, you go to the media tab right here. I've covered import materials populate. Now we're on to media. And basically there are different types of media that you can create, right? And I like to think of them as cameras, but actually they're most more like keyframes of the scene, you know, snapshots of the scene. And here we have the different types. So first one is the images. Second one is animations. Third one is panoramas. So 360 degree uh, images that you can later use either VR goggles or your Android or probably a MacBook, um, sorry, um, Apple phone as well uh, to view a set of panoramas. Um, what was that? A presentation. A presentation basically exports an app that can be opened up on any other computer and you can walk around the scene. It doesn't work that great, but in some cases it's useful. And the last one is the phasing. So basically if you want to showcase how the building is constructed, you would use phasing and, you know, foundation appears, then beams appear and so on. It's quite niche, uh, so we are not going to cover neither uh, presentation mode, nor panoramic modes, nor phasing modes. We're going to cover um, still images as well as animations. So I'm going to go back to the image uh, option. I'll click the plus sign here to add the add an image. And as you can see now, a camera has been placed or a snapshot has been made from the particular view in which I was at, right? Not to say that I can't uh, just navigate to some other place, right? And override this, but you need to do a specific, you click a specific button to override because now if I click on this image, bam, it just snaps me right back to where the image was taken. If you want to override it, let's say from here, then you need to click on this reset or refresh button, right? As you hover the image, refresh button appears. Bam. And now it's locked to that particular angle, right? So that's how you, uh, that's how you can control it. For this uh, particular view, I want it to be central composition and I want it to be something like so. And trust me, you know, we will be adjusting the camera position, but for now this seems to be fine and I'll just reset it. Of course, the trees and so on, those those are just ugly. So I'm going to brush those away and I'll make sure that all of the trees, yeah, that all of the layers are indeed turned on, the painted layers, I mean. And I'll just select one of the prickly junipers, click the eraser tool, make sure that the diameter is, yeah, 10 meters should be fine. And I'll just erase everything that I, you know, that gets in the way. So that's one set erased and then I'll select the other scatter. Um, scatter vegetation asset, select with shift key, all of the trees here, choose the eraser tool again, delete those off from here. Okay, something like that. Escape, escape, escape. All right, so now in terms of camera settings, if I select my, my scene here, right, I'm looking at it, um, all of the lighting and then so on 
all of it is controlled through the camera settings, right? And notice that it's not just the lighting, sorry, through the image settings. So if I select the image, um, I have the settings for that particular image. Thus, I can make it into nighttime, right? There, there should be, yeah, there, there is the moon there. So I make it into nighttime and then I refresh it. I quit media editing mode right above my head. You can see it here, right? Quit media editing mode. We're back to daytime, right? We're going around. That's our regular scene. I click on the image nighttime again, right? So that, that's how it, uh, that's how it works. It's not just the camera itself, but rather the state of the scene in total, including which layers are hidden or which objects are hidden. I turned on the objects in my, you know, gen generally in my scene, the objects were turned on, but in my image here, they were turned off. So I will turn them back on here, reset. Oh, let me make sure that the time of day is decent. Something like that. That's fine. Reset again. Okay. We're, we're good to go. So hopefully that makes sense, right? For per every image, you can have different lighting conditions altogether. I will talk about, about this whole thing a little bit later once we have the camera position set up, but that's, that's how it goes. Let's start by actually going kind of backwards. It's going to be scattered. Every image has different mm, tabs for different material, not material, for different settings, right? So I usually always start with the image tab here, because here we describe how big the image should be. And for that, I think we will need to, I will need to show you this cinematic aspect ratio images. Mm, let's go for this one, open image, right? You can see here that 1.69 is standard aspect ratio for high definition definition video, right? Uh, 16 by, by 9, right? That's the YouTube, uh, YouTube video and so on. And that's the typical aspect ratio that is offered to you by twin motion, right? So if I look at 1920 by 1080, that's the proportion, right? Right here, right? That's the aspect ratio you know, that would fit perfectly on a YouTube video. What we want is we want a cinematic aspect ratio, which is much more stretched. So then we go back to our uh, little diagram here and we take a look at 2.39 by one aspect ratio of current anamorphic widescreen theatrical showings. All of the widescreen TV uh, or not TV, sorry, movies are done with this aspect ratio. There's also 2.75 by one uh, ultra Panavision, but those are very, uh, very niche, right? So 2.39 by one is the aspect ratio to go for. I'll just uh, whip out a calculator. We will need it for now. I have it hidden. And here, the way I usually do this is I first choose my output to be either 4K or 8K. Uh, in this case, we're definitely not going for 8K. We're going 4K right? That's 4K for a YouTube video, for instance. But then I will define the height to be much smaller, right? So that it's wider. It's going to have that particular aspect ratio. How do you do that? Well, you take 3840 and divide it by 2.39 and you get 1,606.645, uh, right? So 1607. And here, I, instead of 2160, I type in 1607. And that aspect ratio is now the wide angle aspect ratio. That's it. That's all, that's all you need to do, right? Um, under details, there is the tiled rendering option. Tiled rendering is used when your graphics card simply cannot render out the image because it gets oversaturated when the RAM uh, video card memory gets oversaturated. Right now I'm at 40%. So I don't think I will, uh, I will need to use it. But if you feel or, or if you see that your computer is crashing during render times, uh, then make sure that styled rendering is turned on. You will need to stitch it, I believe, uh, later on in Photoshop, maybe. Right, so that's that's the format. 
Next step, uh, let's actually work on the camera itself, right? So camera focal length, um, that is just like with the lens here. I can show you how that works. Um, right now, the focal length is 18, and my lens that I use for filming this tutorial is between 18 and 55, and I can show you the difference right now. Let's go for this, right? And let me do, that's, that's 18, right? A little bit distorted, and that, oh my god, <laughs> that is 55, right? So it's, it's kind of a zoom. Uh, kind of a zoom, uh, but more importantly, uh, everything that is rendered at or not rendered, but captured with a lens um, that is of a higher millimeter value, larger focal length lens will be less distorted, will be closer to axonometric projection. So look at how, mm, d not distorted, but how much space there is between the house and the camera and the trees in the back like everything is very much separated if here i change from 18 millimeters which is usually used for interior shots if i change it to something more reasonable like 50 millimeters bam we're right in the you know in the facade and i'll go even further i think i will do like 70 mil shot like so and then with s key i will just move the camera away and try to position it to the best of my abilities. I think it's something like that. It's hard to say. So first of all, let me turn off the scatter. Yeah, I think that that would work. Okay, for now, this is going to be, uh, let me turn on the scatter again. Uh, this is going to be the, the shot, right? I'm going to hit the reset button, the refresh button. And of course, I will delete all of the unnecessary, unnecessary trees. Shoo, 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 go away, go away, go away, go away. Whoa. This one goes away. I will place the trees more appropriately um, after I've kind of calibrated the whole damn thing. All right, so that's step one. Step two is to actually, oh yeah, forgot the other set of trees, sorry. Apologies for that. Delete those, delete that one. No need, don't really need that. those two. That one can stay, okay, escape. Right, so that, that's the shot, the current shot. Now I'm starting to think about how do I want this to, you know, what, what's the look? Uh, how do I want this to look? One second, just going to turn on. Uh, make sure that everything is turned on. Hit the render button to see if it's rendering properly. It does seem like it's rendering properly. And I'm just kind of thinking about the shot. You can see that in the background right now, the trees are they look much bigger, right? It's much more connected with nature. And that, that was the idea behind the seven, 70 millimeter lens. It just forces connection to nature much, much more, right? Let's go back to the shot and the settings of it. That, so that's the focal length. Depth of field is basically blurring, right? So how wide the aperture is, right? Will determine how much things are being blurred that are out of focus, right? So the way you work with this, you should always have this turned on. And right now we're focusing at a distance of one meter, which is, that, that's a no. So we will pick a focus and we'll hit the, the roof, right, with, with our focus. So it immediately finds that we're focusing on something that's 90 meters away, right? And you might say that, well, crap, now nothing is in focus, but that's not true. Uh, sorry, everything's in focus, but that's not true. Everything that is closer here, everything that is closer here will be um, in uh, out of focus, right? And we will use that uh, a little bit later on, right? So that's uh, that's working. If you want to control the amount of defocus, uh, then you need to increase the aperture. The higher the aperture, the sharper the image. Natural values are between 1.6 and 24. Uh, of aperture f stop right okay so that's done then camera effects vignetting is this 
darkening of the outer outer corners of the of the frame that is usually because your lens sucks in our case uh, we, we can kind of mimic a little bit of it so let, let's go for 60 uh, percent of vignetting lens flare is when that well right now you can't see it but it's christopher nolan really likes lens flares uh, lens flare when stuff hits the sorry stuff when light hits the camera just right uh, it, it produces this these kind of effects they're very hard to make nice uh, usually they're quite kitsch so be careful with the lens flares usually i have them at like five percent or so right lens dirt that's basically scratches and so on 70 percent seems to be too much so i'm gonna go with 55 percent sharpness I don't know who would use that. That's just disgusting. 0% sharpness. Chromatic aberration is, again, for very cheap lenses, usually found these days only on cheap um, phone cameras, uh, where RGB uh, values are misaligned. This is doing a very poor job at simulating it because chromatic aberration only happens on hotspots, on areas that are over bright. Right. In this case, it's just kind of slapping on a filter through for the whole image, which is incorrect and should never be used this way. A line camera can force uh, the camera to be to look at a surface perpendicularly, meaning 90 degrees right at the surface. Uh, we trust our muscles and our eyes, so we don't use a line camera. Parallelism is basically if you want to force vertical lines to be vertical uh, we will not be using that because eh, they seem to be vertical enough <laughs> i might use parallelism in other shots spe specifically in interior shots um, near clipping is when you if you want to let me increase this to like uh, 30 meters oh even more uh, 50 meters 60 meters there we go. If you want to clip away stuff that is right in front of the camera, you can use near clipping for this. I just delete things. Right. Then we have the composition overlays. I usually have the grid turned on with, um, where was it? Either with uh, three columns and two rows. Uh, so it should be two like that either with three columns and two rows or with two columns and two rows if i need a central composition in this case it's central so i would use two and two right and the color for it i usually just go for green but it's it's up to you right safe areas i always use safe areas enable that but i only use one so i will disable both of these and for the custom safe area i will use 95 percent Everything that is outside of the safe area uh, will be, you know, I, I might end up trimming away during uh, re reshuffling uh, or refitting. So that in this case, I will not use this, uh, not use the grid, but I will probably keep the safe area um, just just to be <laughs> safe, I guess. And that's it. That's that's uh, those are the camera settings. Not many, but enough to produce decent uh, decent compositions right let's save the camera view again and let's now go into uh, well actually making some 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 um elements in the scene do i have sharpness on yes i do oh my god sharpness zero absolutely always zero right so i want water <laughs> i want water in this right here there should be water so I'm going to, uh, first of all, exit the media mode. Whoa, that's escape out of that. There we go. And here I will create, um, not a lake, but like a river swamp looking thing. And it's quite easy to make. So I'm just going to go to objects, primitives, and I'll use a one by one or 10 by 10 plane like that drag and drop it in now it's rotated weird because it tries to fit on the ground so i'm just going to go to xyz um, let's say object properties and transform properties and i'll 
zero out the rotations in all three different angles like that then I'm going to go into actually let's increase the size so this is going to be my water surface so for the size um, in the x direction I'm gonna say uh, let's do 100 meters and in the y direction let's do 50 meters yeah something like that now I have a water body right with a bunch of trees growing in it don't worry about that for now right I'm going to raise it a bit actually I'm going to go to the image to see how high should it go to actually you know for me to actually see it and then should I go backwards a bit maybe something like that maybe it's it goes down I like that stuff is sticking out from it that's great if I hit render by the way you can see that there is indeed greenery here it just doesn't show up in my in my preview right because it's too far away so keep that in mind uh, maybe something like that that tree will need to go though okay uh, reset quit media mode back to here there's my water body now with this let's go to library materials water that is not under materials is it no it is it should be apologies it's under materials it's water right here and i will use river zero one i guess yeah that that's gonna be fine so there's our river right it's going fast it's going in the weird direction it should be flowing other way around so let's change some settings so water type is weird because there's the, the the settings are completely different right so here i can choose the water depth the higher this value is the more of a leeway the water will have to actually uh, let's r render this the more of a leeway the water will have to actually show through you know the the background the the, the ground underneath it right if i to to tone down the water here it's basically black and when i do 50 meters it's basically transparent right so i'm going to give it like two meters of depth i want it pretty dark right also we can change the color of it to actually uh, maybe i want it blue because everything is so green i want it blue so i'm going to use river zero two <laughs> like that right so you can see the color changed and the water depth let's tone it down to like five meters something like that i like how this works looks pretty good then for the details no there's nothing that we need to change there i actually i should probably explain it right so in terms of details uh, water has caustic uh, information that you can't really see here mm. Well, basically it's these little guys but since the water um, area oh no it's not these guys right come on caustics very hard to find them if we go under the water okay it doesn't doesn't even show never mind so caustics are the reflections in the pool and you can play around with them since this is a river the caustics will not show up it's a swampy river the caustics will not show up so we skip over it um, if you're doing a swimming pool then you can change the size of those kind of ripples like light ripples in the water uh, by changing the size here right besides that it's it's very much uh, just touch and go and then very much um, you just need to experiment with it right to get it to work yeah okay in terms of waves uh, you can increase the intensity or decrease the intensity altogether I will have a little bit of intensity but i don't want it to be over overtaking and in this uh at this point i kind of want to look at it from this angle because i feel like that's that's going to be more 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 important so the same all right then uh pick the water material again for the waves you can change the size of the waves and so on I w uh, this this is a small body of water so the size of waves should be smaller the flow direction as I said that was in the um, the flow was in the incorrect 
uh, at an incorrect angle. So now I changed it by 90 degrees. So now it's flowing better. Let me quit media mode to show you. Right now it's going left to right. Uh, then flow speed. I don't want it to be that fast. So I'm toning it down to like 30%. Wind gust, sure, for sure. And then there's X-ray, but you know, I, I already talked about X-ray, so I'm not going to talk about it again. We, we don't use X-ray. That's what I'm saying. Okay, back to here. I want to showcase more of the water. Maybe we can tone down the camera from 70 millimeters down to like 60 mil. Yeah. Something like that. Well, 60 is too much uh, or too little, 65. Okay, something like that. Let's test render. Okay, that that's gonna that's gonna be fine. Uh, the tree here is not clipping uh, away. That's that's good. So we don't need to delete it. Uh, we're gonna place some some additional trees during the next stage. But I'm I'm quite quite happy with how this how this looks. Okay, so that's uh, camera is done. Uh, image is done. Now on to environment. Actually, should we do environment right now? Maybe no. Maybe we should take care of the environment uh, later. Well, actually there's one thing that I want to show you and that's the weather, right? So in terms of weather, I can just increase, oops increase the slider and as I'm increasing the slider you can see that clouds are popping popping into existence like that <laughs> so that's pretty neat um, I'm going to have them something like something like so something like so I want it to be a little bit a little bit cloudy a little bit cloudy okay save that so that's weather. Then in terms of exposure, I think the exposure was good, but uh, for these kind of scenes, I don't deal with automatic exposure. I turn that, that thing off and instead I just uh, navigate through the exposure slider by, by myself, right? So let's start rendering and let's find a good brightness, right? Uh, for this, <clears throat> remember the thing that we have created? Library, mm, user library, light check, these spheres right here. I'm going to have them out like so. I'm going to render them. And as I'm rendering them, I will look if this is too dark, if this is too bright and then so on, right? So back to here. Uh, I'll go for local exposure. So my exposure, I, I set it to minus 1.5, something like that. But I will hit the, the highlights a bit. So for local exposure, I will to tone down the highlights by 0.75 instead of 0.5. So it hits that area a bit as well as the, uh, whatchamacallit, the sky, right? That actually seems to be pretty decent. The gray is a little bit too dark. Did I make a mistake with the with the middle gray tone? We'll, 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 we'll need to investigate that a little bit later, but I'm not looking at the mid gray. I'm looking at that white, black, and how the reflection works. Seems like everything is under control. Okay. So that's the local exposure, right? Once that is done, I can just don't do, don't delete the image rather Delete the freaking spheres. <laughs> right. Back in here. Uh, let me turn off XYZ. We don't need that. Um, time of day. The shadows seem to be quite nice, so I'm not going to mess uh, around with that too much. Weather. That's fine. Location. We already. I already showed you. It, it's basically you can offset the north. Uh, as well as you can choose where your project is located at. 
really doesn't matter and it's it's a fictional project so we don't don't really deal with that and then we have the hdri environment so i was getting to this so the hdri environment is an alternative to how you can light the scene you can either light it with just the sky system you know global lighting uh, time of day system blah blah, blah or you can use an image to light the scene. And I'll cover this once we get into the interior shot because that's a little bit nicer. Um, it's, it's a bit nicer to use HDRI lighting for interior because then you can get soft shadows on the inside. And then there's the horizon, um, not mapping, but basically you can add an image onto the horizon. We, I don't know, I, I don't like it, so I'm not gonna not gonna use it, but basically if I have this enabled um, there <laughs> behind the trees, uh, let's let's try to hide some vegetation here and there. Behind the trees, you can see, you know, like a skyscraper and so on. That That's the horizon that was added in, right? Um, I will not use that. I don't care about that at all. And then there's the ocean system. So you can place everything on the ocean. The ocean is usually at one meter height. So I can push it down a bit. Come on. I mean, it's it's nice, but we don't uh, minus like three meters. It's nice, but we don't need it is, is what I'm saying, right? So I'm just going to disable the ocean. Okay. Okay, that, that's, that's that, right? We have one scene kind of ready for detailing. Detailing is going to be a big part of it. So this is uh, final reset. Oh yeah, and uh, I forgot, there's two more options, or not options, but like uh, two more settings here that I need to cover. Render settings and FX settings. So under render settings, there's either you choose to render this image as real time or path tracer, right? Static images are always rendered with Path Tracer because it's by far the highest quality that you can get uh, from Twin Motion. Uh, real time is used for animations when you need to render out animations simply because it's too intense. It's too too heavy to render with Path Tracer. It takes too long. I personally also render animations with Path Tracer, but be prepared to wait two days for the render to finish. I'm not exaggerating. Like. 20 second video, two days is decent you know, on one computer, yeah, as long as you're rendering on one computer. Then we have global illumination. Uh, you either can calculate light with standard method, which is used, has been used throughout uh, all versions of Twin Motion, or there's a new type of calculation that's called Lumen. It's much, much heavier. Right now we're at 16 frames per second, 54 GPU RAM uh, usage. 98% GPU usage. If I hit it with Lumen, <laughs> it literally increased in performance. <laughs> okay, so we just use Lumen. <laughs> so Lumen is more accurate in, in terms of how it deals with light. It's, uh, okay. So when motion belongs to Epic Games, just like Fortnite, just like Unreal Engine 5. Unreal Engine 5 has had Lumen for a while now, and finally Lumen has been brought into Twin Motion as a new way of how to calculate light. It's better than standard way of calculation in all possible regards. So you should always use Lumen if you can. It's in only in the newest version, and sometimes it's heavy. This time it's not. I am not sure how that works. It's weird, right? But we use Lumen. In, in Lumen, uh, you visualize mesh conflicts. The purple, I believe, is when it's overlapping, right? Uh, magenta areas are too complex and yellow areas are too small, big or far away. Okay, so for Lumen, all of the greenery is too complex to properly calculate. That is fine. Uh, you can always increase the scene detail, hope, hoping that Lumen will catch up. No, it doesn't. Okay, so we just keep it at four or three. The view distance, this is how far away Lumen uh, draws the calculations from. Um, I usually have it at half a kilometer, like 500 meters for these kind of scenes. You don't really need to calculate anything further out than that. And then lighting update speed, you don't really need it to update that uh, that often. But this is, all of these are 
what, what, what's what's uh, what's a good name for it? Uh, all of these settings are optimization settings, meaning that you only start fiddling with them if the scene itself is starting to crash, right? But uh, for global illumination, lumen should be used all the time. Then we have lumen reflection settings, right? See the reflections there? If I have this at optimized, they're kind of gone or they're much more crappy. If I have them at full, it's reflecting. That's nice. Then we can increase how many bounces it should do. Um, so if you have two mirrors, how many times should it bounce between the two mirrors? Uh, for four calculations. I wouldn't go beyond five uh, because usually it's unnecessary. Um, you don't really have a very kind of mirror castle looking environment, right? And then for the quality, we can just ramp it up to two. You can see that immediately. Oh, actually it didn't drop as much. The CPU increased a bit. Um, that might be my recording though. And then for the shadows, it's how far away should the shadows be calculated. I also have this at 500 meters and the shadow bias, I don't really remember. I think it should be at 0 0.5. Increasing this value reduces self-shadowing artifacts on objects, but can also reduce the accuracy of shadows. We will not use that. <laughs> we will not change that. Um, and that's it, that's it. Uh, those are your um, settings, right? Uh, the render settings. Finally, we are on to the fx or well we should change to path tracer for that because we are going to use path tracer for rendering notice how much more light path tracer gets and we go into fx fx uh, basically just has um, contrast and saturation settings as well as you can add filters onto your scene please don't add any instagram filters or anything like that for color gradient you can play around with them but I mean, usually the color grading is not that great. Uh, ISM, D17 compared to none. Well, actually D17 is pretty good. I might use it. It just warms everything like crazy. D16, copper. D18, that seems good. And the further you go uh, through these settings, the more like weird they become. Um, and there, there's too too many, or not settings, sorry, filters, color gradient filters. So D17 was actually not that bad. I'm, I'm gonna keep it. It's a little bit too autumn -y for me, but that's that's fine, right? Um, in terms of contrast, brightness, <clears throat> I like the way it is, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it the way it is. Right. Pause that. Okay, with that done, we can move on to creating. The, our second image, and then I'll show you the HDRI thing. All right, so to render out, or not render, prepare our second image, that's going to be an interior shot. I'm going to first quit media mode, of course, uh, select anything inside of my uh, building, and then find an angle that would work. And damn, this would need a lot of work. So instead, Oh, maybe, maybe something like this. Okay. Maybe we're onto something here. Something like that. And then we can do a central one. Okay. So I'll just add, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm just adding in a new uh, image here, a new shot here, and we're going to be working on it. So first things first, I go to render. I choose global illumination, I change it to lumen. I'm gonna go much faster now. I change it to lumen, I uh, use scene detail. Oh, I hope it's gonna work. Oh, we'll see. Scene detail, all of that seems good. I'm, I'm just going to have it as default. Then for camera, I think I'm gonna leave it at 18 millimeters, but what I really want is my composition overlays to enable them. Uh, sorry, I, I need to enable the grid and I want this to be centered and everything else work with the rule of thirds. So something like so. A little bit higher, higher, higher. Okay. I'm basically looking at this area right here and I'm tilting the camera so that uh, this 
column or beam here column here is vertical it's not as distorted okay something like that good so that's that's the first thing then back to our view here let's wait did i mess it up oh no i forgot to save it or or to re refresh it so back to here one third it's gonna hit that area that's fine and then it's hitting that area that's also fine hmm that's a lot of ceiling height or ce ceiling oh but never mind never mind because we need to change the proportion of it right so we go to image 3804 or 3840 by 1607 uh, like that yeah yeah that's good and now we go back 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 trying to find a good angle here I think this will work. This should work. So now we need to fix the light because the light is just garbage, right? So I'm going to reset this. There we go. Go to the environment, global lighting. Oh, and right, we're not gonna be using global lighting. We're using HDRI for this. So HDRI is basically an image that wraps around your scene and it produces light. It shines light onto your um, objects, right? Uh, instead of the sun. You can use Sun and HDRI in tandem, but I would suggest choosing either one of the systems and just running with that. So under environment, HDRI environment, I will enable it. Sky Dome is uh, turned on. There's also backdrop HDRI, but we don't care about it. And for now it's using Noon Clear HDRI. I am actually going to, oops. That's wrong, wrong. Um, I'm going to go back to the library, HDRI environments, outdoors, and I'll find, or sorry, is there like sky? Yeah, skies. And I'll find the low sun or morning or afternoon sun that is cloudy. And I'll just download, uh, let's try different ones. Let's try this one, me OAF cloudy. AF is probably out of focus or something. Cloudy, I don't know. Um, drag and drop it in to instead of noon clear right here. Wait for it. Keep waiting for it. Hmm. That doesn't feel correct. Let's go to details. Lock sun to HDRI, turn that one off. Oh wait, do we need to turn? Yeah, yeah, we need to turn on path tracer to actually, to actually properly see it. So let's turn off the path tracer. Yeah, that's locked, that's good. And then let's play around with rotation until increase the intensity until we find, you know, like an output that, that, that we like. This is going to take a while, so I'm going to make a time lapse of it. It's just going to be me trying out different HDRIs, seeing what works, what doesn't work and so on. Okay, I have probably found the phot photogrammetry, the, the, the HDRI image that I feel like would, will work. So low sun clear zero two, and that's the one. But also I found a weird thing that happens with the fabric material. It seems like it's translucent. So I'm going to investigate it a little bit further and I'll take you on for, for the ride as well, just so that, you know, 
you can also troubleshoot if something goes wrong. Uh, let me just save that particular shot and let's grab a pipette tool and see what kind of material we have here. Furniture and fabric material with translucency. Okay, so it is indeed translucent, meaning that if the light hits it, the material itself will start bouncing light inside of it. And because of that, if I'm rendering this, you can see that it behaves like wax, you know, it's uh, unnatural. So we don't want any translucency in our pillows. So I'm going to go to materials tab, uh, create a new standard material, call it pillows or not. Yeah, I, I can call it pillows. Pillows. And then for it, I'm going to get it's furniture fabric. So I'm going to take the maps from furniture fabric and add them to the pillows material. So under details, I'm going to grab the copy, the color and add that to the color of my pillows paste. And actually I can already just drag, drag it on right here to replace it. Then I will probably has some roughness map. Yep. Copy that. Add that to my pillows roughness map. Uh, I saw that UV scale is 0.2 by the way, so I'm replacing it as well. Uh, like that. Paste. Roughness needs to be at 50% together with the map. Uh, metallic of course is zero. There's going to be a normal map as well. So for furniture, scroll, 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 find the normal map, details. Normal map is at 100%. I'm just going to paste the normal map here. Okay, that's it. Now uh, I can purge this. And now if I render, there's not going to be any weird translucency involved, right? So that's, that's how you troubleshoot those things. Of course, this will need a few more elements here and there, but um, with that being said, I'm, I'm kind of kind of happy with this scene as well, right? So we can, uh, can we move on or do I make final adjustments? I'll make final adjustments, right? Um, so for the interior scene, um, we do need to focus on, you know, certain aspect of the environment. So I'm going to go first, I'm going to fix the camera. Environment is basically done, right? Uh, all we needed to do is just grab the HDRI environment and now every time when we do path tracing, by the way, it only works on path traced images. It doesn't work in the, you know, in this kind of a lumen preview or raster preview, it only works in path traced. Um, exposure seems to be okay. I disabled uh, auto exposure. So now I'm, I'm sitting at 11 uh, exposure compensation. Uh, for weather, uh, weather doesn't matter because we're using an HDR image. Location doesn't matter, horizon doesn't matter. Okay, so all of this is done. This portion is done. I'm just looking at, should it be uh, under FX? Well, just give, give me a second. Environment, where the hell is the sun reflections and intensity, sun size, ambient, white balance, that's whatever. That's whatever. There we go. Weather, under weather details, there's the fog. So you can change the appearance or how, how intense the fog is. Right now it's at 15%. So I, if I have it at 100%, you can see that it's all very foggy, but I'll have it at like 40%-ish. So that it's, it's kind of foggy, maybe even more, maybe 60. Yeah. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit foggy in the, in the background and in terms of vegetation growth, I will just increase, uh, this is better to show with just regular preview vegetation growth controls how big the trees are. So I'm just going to ramp them, ramp them up to almost one, something like that. Mm messes with the light a little bit too much. So let me drop it down to 
Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. We, we can deal with that. Okay, final, final adjustments. Of course, we go to library, um, user library, grab the spheres in here, drag them in. For some reason, kicked me out of the path traced render. And we take a look at the different values here. So what's up with the gray? Okay, give me a second. Yo, why is mid gray so dark? We're at 46. Shouldn't it be, oh, wait. It should be other way around, right? It should be there. Okay, and anyway, I'm just going to, uh, sure, 92. I'll say that mid gray, that this is kind of mid gray and that that's 92. That, that, that's it. Um, that was weird. Okay, so now let's render again. Uh, and you can see that the white is really not, not, not bright enough, right? It needs a little bit more oomph. So I'm going to go to my scene right here and I'm going to uh, go to exposure and just ramp up exposure even further. So 13, something like that. And 13 seems to be quite good in terms, in terms of exposure, but now things are over bright. So I'm going to reduce the highlights to 0.8 you know, so that th this is not, highlight is not burning out too much, maybe 0.9. And don't really need to boost the shadows, so that's good. And now we have some leeway to go for 13 uh, and a half. But that might be too bright. That's a little bit too bright because you can see the mid gray is burning out. So we're going back to 13. Maybe even 12. How does 12 look like? No, 12 is too dark, uh, 12 and a half. That's like 90% by the way of rendering. <laughs> All right, and with that done, we can now uh, actually delete the light checking tool. Um, and we can move on to, there we go. Uh, we can move on to create uh, even more sets. Let me just double check if everything that I have done so far, if that's enough. I think camera effects, we increase the vignetting a bit. We decrease the lens flare a bit. We decrease the lens dirt as per usual. Nothing else is necessary here. Camera, depth of field, we enable it and we focus on uh, probably these books right here. And the aperture, we use a reasonable aperture of 1.6. Uh, aperture of one is just insane. Uh, actually, oh yeah, that's cool. Um, so aperture is how, op how open the lens is. And if you don't have auto exposure, it also drives the the brightness of the image. So if we do 1.6, that's still pretty good. Let's look at the render. Yeah, that seems to be decent. It became a little bit darker, right? So we might end up needing to brighten it up under environment, exposure compensation to 13.5. Back in here. Yeah. Now, 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 13.5 is actually good. So it's it's a balancing act between like multiple different uh, different settings, right? Okay, reset that. Take a look at other things. Nope. Don't need to change anything else. Okay, so we have two shots now. I'm going to make a few more shots, and I'm going to make it into uh, time lapse, of course. Right. So yeah, time lapse time.
All right, we're done. So I will, for this tutorial or for this course, I will do four static images and then I will of course show you how to do an animation as well. But the images that I've chosen or the cameras that I've chosen are this one right here. This one right here, you've seen them. This one right here. And this one right here, one close up one, right? So that should be, yeah, that, that, that should be enough for, for us to get a pretty good look, right? So now, now on to creating lights and in particular to, you know, make this scene that we have here a little bit brighter, you know, give it a little bit more bizarre. So we will turn on some artificial lighting here. That's the next chapter, lights. So there are two ways of how you can create light, artificial light in your, uh, in your scene. One is by creating an object and then applying an emissive material on that object. And the second one is by actually creating a light source from this library menu right here. So I'll start with the creating an object with the emissive material on it. I'll go to objects primitives, I'll just create a box, you know, one cubic meter box, like that. I'll move it up to somewhere here. If I render this, you know, that the box is just acting like a box. I mean, it's, it's a white box. But if I go to my materials tab here and create a new standard material and call it uh, light, or emissive, emissive would be more accurate. Then I can scroll down here and find the emissive tab, expand that and increase the glow uh, up to a certain level of nits. Can we choose? No, we can't choose lumens. Okay, it's gonna be nits of brightness. And I then I can just slap it on the box material or sorry, the box. And now it's just filling the whole space with light. And of course, this is way too intense, 25,000 nits. Let's try something more reasonable, like 300. Even with 300, you know, it's a nuclear explosion. And that is because our HDRI map is very low in its brightness values. Thus, everything that we create here is going to be very, uh, will also need to be very low. We're basically compensating for a very, very dark scene. So let's try five nits. Five nits seems to be doing just fine, right? This tells me using five nits and it showing up as a bright object tells me that the scene is w out of whack in terms of its brightness values. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to go into the media tab, click on this image, uh, image settings, uh, go to the environment, HDRI environment, and I'll increase its intensity to 10. something like that. With its intensity set to 10, hmm, that box is very much in the way. Let me just delete it for now. Try that again. Even with HDRI intensity set to 10, it seems to be not doing much. So let's try 100. Hmm. Yeah, now it's super bright, like everything is over bright. So now we need to rebalance it uh, through through the settings right here, exposure settings. Instead of 13, I will use something closer to 11. Oh, even, no, actually 11 might work. Let's do 10. One f-stop is uh, two times less light getting in. So between 11 and 10, there is two times less light. Between 10 and nine, there's two times less light even further, right? So exposure values at nine seems to be okay. Uh, let's let's use that. So back to, the, to our box, slap that one in here. Materials, add the light material on it. You can see now, five nits of brightness is basically basically nothing, right? It, it's not shining. So I will need to increase its 
an emissive map up to 50 nits. Hmm. Um, it's shining a bit, 100 nits. Something like that, okay. So for 100 nits, we're filling the space again with light. Then of course, there's the options to change the color of it. If I expand the details, there's the color temperature that I prefer to use to change the the actual color of the of the light source, right? And then there's the gamma and saturation. We don't we don't care about those. You can also use an image, by the way, to you know project some sort of an image that shines light, but that is usually only used on TV screens or computer screens, right? On any any screen. In this case, um, 100 nits red color fills the space quite well with light. So it's still a little bit unbalanced, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a pass. Right, so that's how you, how you make it with the material. Now, how do you make it with an, 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 uh, an actual object, right? An actual light object? Well, it's super simple. Here we have a bunch of different light sources. Most of them are IES light sources, which is like a spectrum, uh, spectrum, uh, I forgot the name for IES, how it translates, but it's basically different types of distribution of the light accord, uh, within the light cone, right? So you can have different um, flavors of your spotlights. In my case, I will use the simple, most simple one, a spotlight. And I'll just slap it on right there on the ceiling. And you can see that, you know, it has a certain cone angle and it shines light. That That's all we need. So. In terms of the spotlight, I can increase its intensity. Uh, now it's in lumens. So a reasonable intensity in lumens is around 500 for for a spotlight that is kind of anchored at um, 3.4 meter ceiling height, 3.2 meter ceiling height. And attenuation radius is basically how far away does it reach before it diminishes completely. 10 meters is fine. Cone angle, that's how sharp the spotlight is. I will keep it at around 50, 50 degrees. Press render and you can see it shining here just a tiny bit, right? It's a little bit awkward without having any um, spotlights in the ceiling. So give me a second, I'll just model out some, uh, some areas here in the ceiling for us to actually anchor the spotlights to. One second. Right, so I have uh, finished the material, uh, not material, the light creation, and now I'm just uh, dealing with the, the the material itself. So, in short, the color of it, the temperature of it. I think we will have it at around 6,000 Kelvin or 4,800 maybe. Let's have it warmer uh, with the glow of like 15 nits, something like that. Let's take a look at how it actually works. Media, image two. Okay, doesn't look that great. Yeah, here, here it's kind of fine, right? So we have a few spotlights that are turned on. Simple as that. That being said, I kind of want to tone down the exposure even further. So where was it? It was set to nine, let's do eight. Let's look at it again. Yeah, sure. Eight, eight, eight is better. Um, seven. Just so that we can see if the light will work or not. <laughs> okay. So with this toned down quite a bit, now let's add some spotlights in here. And the easiest way to do it is honestly just to kind of drag, drag and drop. So basically assembling one of them. Bam, like that. And then just changing the color temperature to fit with what you want, 4,800. Uh, changing the cone angle back to 50 
degrees, um, intensity down to, or rather 300 lumens, let's do 500 lumens, right? Something like this. And then, since we want multiple of these um, copies, right? I'm just going to hold the shift key and drag by the central central area here, right? Shift and drag, snap it to here. And it's gonna ask me, uh, what, should it be an instance or a copy? I'm gonna say that it should be an instance, right? Because now any change that we make is going to be made to all of the uh, lights all together. I'll show you how that works in just a second. Oops, made the booboo there. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to select all of the spotlights. Why do I have one that is just in the middle of the room? Oh, that's the old one, isn't it? All of these. And then I will make more, even more copies of them. Right here, just make sure that they align. And this time I'm going to do two instances of them. Ah, it's my bad. Ah, navigating is hell. Okay. Try to move it in the correct position. Failing clearly, but it is what it is, right? And now, maybe, maybe one more, maybe here. There we go. It doesn't need to be perfectly aligned, right? Because, well, actually it kind of does because we have the, that ugly uh, fog fog effect there that we will need to definitely deal with because this is uh, you know, that's bad. That's bad. We don't want that um, So now let's go back to the view and let's see if we have more light We surely have too much light, but now thankfully any spotlight that we choose we can tone down its uh, intensity And you can see that all of them tone down right so I can do 200 lumens for them Something like this. It's very uniform now, very annoying, um, but it is what it is, I guess. Perhaps if we change the cone angle to like 35 degrees, eh, now there's there's hot spots. So, you know, <laughs> there it's, it's a balancing act uh, between multiple light sources and how do you not burn out your interior. I always have troubles with these, so I guess it's time for another time lapse of me just trying to figure this out. Okay, so I worked it out a little bit differently. We will have two shots, one in the nighttime, one in the daytime. Just makes sense for, for me to do a night shot to show you the artificial lights, right? So now if I were to you know, use the path tracer, here we have the spotlights kind of hitting the tables and so on. And here we have a daytime shot where the spotlights are turned off as well as the lights there. All I'm doing is I'm just hiding the certain certain elements in the scene for this particular shot here, right? So toggling it on and off. So back to the nighttime shot. That That's what we have so far. Oh, one thing that I had to change for this to work was where we have the spotlights any anyone, oh, well, I guess this one, right? Um, I had to turn on the shadows. I'm not sure why the shadows are turned off in the fir first place, but I had to turn them on right here. So so that actually the, the light produces shadows because that's, you know, that's how it was before, completely horrible. And with the shadows, at least it's a little bit more believable, right? 
Then in terms of the attenuation, I think five meters is not enough. So we increase it a bit. No, it's actually something else. That's weird. That, that's weird. That's weird. Or maybe it's the shadow, the end of the shadow is hitting there. I'm not sure how that works, but that area looks funky. With that being said, everything else seems to be a-okay. Now looking at this, this part right here of the room. Let's turn off the render. This part right here, I can show you some IES lights, right? Uh, let's just put some on the ceiling right there. So you can see that the the way IES lights it hits the the spaces is different, right? Compared to the regular spotlights, it basically has a different type of um, this rose um, or, or flower, the, the the light distribution flower, um, with which you can also design, right? So that that's quite a nice nice feature to have. I will decrease the intensity of it to like 50. Oh, that's 500 to like 50 lumens, just so that when I render, it's not too intense. It's still too intense. <laughs> so let's do 25 lumen, you know, just barely hitting it. And then don't forget the shadows. I'm not sure why the shadows are turned off. That's really weird, right? And we, we will just have it like so, always on. Uh, same thing with the kitchen. Let's go to the kitchen here. I will just add a few IES lights. Let me just find IES 20. I think that that's going to be a decent one. Like that. Shift key. Get one in there. Uh, two, two copies or two instances rather. And then the intensity back to like 30 or something. Right just to have, uh, have a little bit of, uh, of light information there. Now, if I go back to my other renders here, you can see that it's invisible, right? You can't, oh, actually you can uh, kind of see uh, the lights shining in, in, in this area, but nowhere there. Um, should we keep it? I'm not sure. It seems to be a little bit distracting. So I will actually select the IES lights in this shot and I'll just have them hidden, right? Turned off. Uh, refresh shot. Next one. In this one, I have all of the lights on. That's fine. In this one, sure, we can have them be on. That's okay. This one doesn't care. And this one um, doesn't care. Okay, that's it. That's it. Right. So in terms of the lights, that's pretty straightforward. You just create lights. Don't forget to add the shadows and then it's just placing them, right? And then placing them where you need them. Don't don't overdo it. Right, um, next chapter. Let's move on. All right, so we're ready to begin with our render settings. Truth be told, all of our settings have already been set up during the camera portion of the of the tutorial so now it's just the quality settings right so for the still images i'm going to go to the animation in just a second and then we're going to do a little bit of detailed work but that's going to be a time lapse but for the still images we use path tracing right so if i go here to my image one make sure that path tracer is turned on the reason why we're using path tracing instead of real time it's because it's better, you know, it's just simply better in terms of how it calculates light. But of course, it's much, much heavier and it hits your uh, graphics cards uh, like a like a truck. Um, generally speaking, twin motion is very poorly optimized for speed uh, in, in terms of render times. Uh, other softwares are much better, but with that being said, compared to um, V-Ray, Octane Render, or uh, Blender Cycles, any type of like, true to life render, right? A more accurate render, uh, Twin Motion is uh, still much, much faster, right? Uh, even with Path Tracer. So with Path Tracer turn turned on, if I just kind of wait a little bit, you can see that eventually the whole noise 
is just gone and it's gone like it's magic well it's not magic it's ai yeah and the issue with ai uh, denoising is that it leaves um, the, the same issues that you see in ai generated images it's like this soapy smudgy dreamlike effect that is very uncanny and very uh, not tasty so to say <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to the first thing that we do is we always untick the denoiser option here right we keep it noisy and then instead we're going to increase the samples per pixel from 256 to 512 or actually even better you can keep it as 256 but then you you would need to render out a test image to see how much you need to bump up the samples for it to not be noisy anymore. So I'm, I am going to actually use 512 for this. Um, samples per pixel are basically how many passes does it do for each individual pixel while calculating its um, brightness values as well as, uh, as well as its RGB values, right? So hue, saturation, brightness. Then we have the maximum bounces. Maximum bounces is for the light. And that's basically how many times does the light bounce around be before it stops being calculated. So I have this set to six. For an exterior shot, six is fine. For an interior shot, you want it at 10. Emissive materials, um, we don't have any in this shot, so it doesn't matter. But if you want to globally turn off the calculation of light bounces for emissive materials, you can do so right here. And the last one uh, of the settings is this uh, fireflies setting right here. That is basically if I wait long enough while, while this is rendering, I don't know if um, the compression will hold it, but you can see these white spots where my mouse is pointing at one, two, three, at least three white spots on the roof. Right. Um, also, some are in the shadows. Those white spots are called fireflies and they are like uh, a mistake, I guess, that uh, the path tracing algorithm makes. And you can re reduce the intensity of them by reducing the slider right here. The issue with that is if you reduce the slider too much, you're going to kill your scene. So let me go. Yeah, there we go. Something like this just destroys the scene. So. I tend to just keep the fireflies unless they are really apparent and really a problem. And that's basically it. We just increase the samples, we remove the denoiser, we re uh, decrease the max bounces and we're good to go, right? So once this is done, I just refresh and we move on to the next one. I'll do one more and then we'll move on to actually making a, um, a video, a video. Right, so which one should we do? Maybe let's do an interior shot in the morning. So here, I might use a denoiser because I know that it's going to take a very long time to, like it's going to take so many samples to calculate properly the all of the bounces because I do need 10 bounces of light and there's a lot of reflections going on and so on. So I will probably keep the denoiser, uh, but in, at the same time, I'm going to increase the samples per pixel to 512. Yeah, something like that. That that should that should do it. We'll see once it's rendered if if I will need to to make any more adjustments. Right. So basically, you just go through every single image that you have and you um, increase the samples to five twelve, or if you you're feeling lucky, keep it at two five six for interior shots. You can use a denoiser, I would suggest against it. I, I'm just keeping it in so that when I show you the example, then we can look at the different artifacts that the denoiser has compared to the non-denoised image, right? Um, I'll just do this one real quick as well. 512, uh, actually like four bounces. Don't, don't really need many bounces here. No emissive materials, no denoiser, we're good to go and so on, right? Now let's do something more fun. Let's do, an, let's go back in here and let's create an animation, right? So I'm, I'm locking in the camera to this angle. I'm going to go to the animations tab. I'm going to turn off path tracing. 
Oh, it's ugly. <laughs> um, and then with path tracing turned off, I'm going to create a f my first keyframe here, right? So whatever you see on the screen is going to be keyframed, meaning the animation is going to either move from that frame or towards that frame. So this frame seems nice. I'm just going to click on this plus sign. Bam, adds this keyframe. And then I can just press W key, move in a bit, just like that. And I want the camera to move out, right? So this new keyframe is going to be added before the original one, right? So I'm going to click the plus sign on the left hand side rather than the right hand side. If I click the plus sign on the right hand side, then it's going to move into this new keyframe. If I press the plus sign on the left hand side, it's going to move from this keyframe to, you know, the previous one uh, that, that we have created. So plus here. And now we can see we have two keyframes, this one and this one. If I press play, I can already see the animation, right? Once you export it, it's going to be a little bit better. Don't, don't worry, right? I will see the animation and it takes 10 seconds to do. The seconds are written here, you know, the time, how long does it take? So I can make it much faster. One second, play, play, play. If you want it to loop, you just click on this little button right here. And now if I press play, it's just going to loop between the two keyframes. Make sense? Hopefully it does. Okay, so with that done, uh, now we can make some adjustments to the focus and then so on per individual keyframe. Also notice this icon right here. This icon means raster image, meaning that it's going to render out once you render it it's going to render out as a raster image this icon right here oops this one right here means that it's a path traced image right so make sure that all of the images that that you're rendering are going to be actually path traced right lock that in go back in here click on the video and now, now we can we can continue. So the animations are going to be rendered out real time because one hour per image, uh, 30 frames per second, that's there's no way <laughs> that we're going to be able to render it out, you know, in, in the time that we have. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just looking. We might need to decrease the the output size, but that's that's gonna be later. Okay. So in terms of these, uh, the, the settings for these animations, you can either have global settings for both of them. So for this whole video part, if I click on settings, then both of these will change at the same time. So you don't need to change them individually or, or I can click on them individually and I can change settings for them. So for, for example, I can say that as I am closer to the building, I actually want the time of day to be a little bit earlier on. Click on the little refresh button, lock that in. And then as I play, you can see that the, see how the sun changes? I can make it more drastic if, uh, if you want to. So uh, let's go for midday. Refresh, new, right? Like that. And let's let's make it like uh, three seconds, so that it's cl more clear, right? So that's one. Oh, we're we're hitting the computer pretty hard now with the animation going. So instead of that, I still want it to be pretty late. So seven o'clock, uh, refresh, play. Yeah. So you can change it. Uh, you can change everything per um, shot, right? Per, uh, sorry, per keyframe, or you can change everything global uh, in, in, in a global way by clicking on the settings here. Once you are done with the shot, and I will just say that I'm, I'm, I'm done. Sure, I'm, I'm done with the shot. Uh, you can 
click on these three little dots here and choose to collapse. So what it does, well, let's, let's choose collapse. What it does, it just condenses everything as this is done, right? This, this is done and this is your first cut of the video. And you know how videos have like, the you're zooming into the building and you're then you're flying over the building and then you're looking at the corner of the building and then you're on the inside and so on it has multiple cuts right so this is one of the cuts that we have made let's make another one right so i'm just going to play this until it until the end and then i'm going to uh should i quit media mode no not really we we stay in the media mode and i will just navigate something like that somewhere here down you know uh, I'll, I'll use this shot for it and maybe at the start we're looking uh, give me a second something like that right and I'll just click on this little plus sign right here add uh, a video part right just like that and now I want to test one thing out uh, just bear with me if I go back to my original images right here and I find my uh, image of this corner and I click on these three dots here can I copy ambience and then go back to the video click on my uh, video here select three dots and paste ambience didn't really do much did it okay so that's not working <laughs> hey it is what it is okay let's let's move on um we have this image right here and i am going to just move the camera just like that or rather let, let's first fix the the light and the camera of this particular image so first of all time of day probably a little bit brighter than for the camera depth of field for sure the focus now let's do a focus on the back here just like that or actually it's a little bit weird is it defocusing at least oh yeah that for sure yeah that's defocusing so let's let's focus on that corner right there at 34 meters um i want the focal length to be around 50 mil don't really need a larger larger than that focal length oops mm, kind of want it to be more of a detail Yeah, something like that. Something like, like that will do the trick. And okay, let's say we're happy with it. We refresh, of course, uh, we save the changes and I'm going to move it in and to the side and look up more towards the sky like that. And I'm going to hit it with another frame, right? So now we have two frames here. Let's just see how they play out in 10 seconds that's fine could be better okay so now for each of these uh, we are able of course to change the time of day so I'm just going to find and that's fine there you know we, we get a little bit of a tree situation going on there so let's refresh that and then for this one maybe early morning refresh that play the quality of course will <clears throat> will increase once we start setting it up okay uh, this this seems to be okay right so now we have two cuts how do they transfer they transfer just simply by jumping from one to the other but if you click on uh, and let me collapse this one as well 
you can, by the way, after collapsing, you can also expand. So it's not, it's, it's reversible, right? Collapse that one. Um, and then for the cuts, you can choose, should it fade to black, fade to white, or just have a cut, right? So we're just going to have a cut between these two. Now the transition should be a little bit smoother, yeah? It just kind of jumps to the next one. All right, <clears throat> two video clips. Let's adjust the settings of them, right? So first one under render, we can choose either standard preview or lumen preview if you're using the newest version of Twin Motion. Uh, for the scene detail, uh, we can, if I drop that, no, we need it to be at around eight, I guess just to make sure that all of the grass is not, not being messed up. View distance, 500 meters, that is actually fine. Uh, lighting update speed, let's increase it to four. See if that helps with, whoa, that just jumped right through. Okay, let's expand this and make sure that the settings are applied to both of these. So back to render. Yeah, scene detail, you can see that now it's multiple details that are set. So I'm going to do this again eight and four play yeah it seems to be okay settings again um, visualize mesh conflicts shows you the messy parts and of course all of the greenery is just not having it <laughs> you know it's having troubles being displayed but that's that's fine then for the lumen reflection settings crank the quality to the max you can see immediately the GPU is just being hit like crazy. Maybe to the max was a bad idea. Maybe we do like six for the quality. And then for the bounce count, we do um, like how many for the, an exterior shot? Four should be enough. It becomes very blue. That's weird. And then for the shadows, uh, the only thing that we might end up changing is the shadow bias, but not, not really. Let, let's not mess with the shadows. Okay. Once that is done, we just apply this. Check that one out. Yeah, that, that's also being, uh, that's already applied. That's great. Um, then we expand this and up expand. And we do exactly the same thing to it, right? Go to settings here. Scene detail, that's fine, fine, fine. Update speed, ramp it up to four so that it updates fast. Uh, quality for reflections up to six. Uh, bounce count, actually like four. And shadow by 0 0.5, that's okay. Actually, I wonder how does it deal with the trees? When it's one, it's bad. When it's zero, it's kind of bad. So 0 0.5 seems to be actually pretty good. Okay. So now let's, let's test this out. I can see that I'm re really reaching here with, with the, how, how much my, my graphics card can handle. <clears throat> but this feels like it's, it's going to work, right? Again, uh, all of the graininess and so on, that's, that's going to be fixed during the export, hopefully. If it doesn't, we'll need to default to the standard uh, preview mode, which is this, which is much, much worse <laughs> you know, than, than Lumen. Hey, but it is what it is. I forgot one thing. So for this final shot, the focus needs to be on the, on the corner here rather than the trees there. So I'm going to go to camera, pick focus, Click on the corner. Mm, yeah, somewhere there. 12 meter, yeah. Refresh that, okay. Now we are good to go, right? We have our static images, we have our video. <clears throat> so it's re ready to be rendered. Before I do that though, I will add a few details specifically to you know, the images, images here, by the way, to get rid of the, any tool that is running, just right click your mouse and it's going to cancel, it's going to cancel the tool. 
So what I want is I want a few rocks here and there and a few details uh, in this area, specifically in that area as well. Uh, for this shot, also a few details here and there. This shot is good as it is. A few things on the tables and, 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 and whatnot, maybe a carpet. Maybe we'll, we'll find some sort of a nice, nice carpet, right? So yeah, that, that, that's gonna be the next thing. Um, time, lapse time, as per usual. All right, we are ready to render this out. And of course, in Twin Motion, it's called exporting, but it's the same thing, uh, same same logic, right? Um, you will notice that I have deleted one of the interior shots simply because it was I didn't spend enough time on it and it was too ugly. I just used that particular interior shot in the nighttime to show you the uh, artificial lighting and the way you can do artificial lighting. So instead for the interior, that's this is going to be the only shot that I am going to have. And instead, it's, we're gonna do three exterior shots as well as uh, two or one animation with two cuts in the in the animation, right? So that's that's the premise. That's the idea. <clears throat> no more settings. Nothing needs to be changed. We go back to our not back, but we go to our export tab now, right? As I wait, let me double check. Go back here images yeah that's perfect okay that's good mm -hmm. as i uh, click on the export <clears throat> in here and let me click on xyz so that it's not in the way uh, you can see that there's two options for exporting either local export or cloud export cloud costs money i believe it should it should you're, you're basically using epic game servers to export stuff and you can only export panorama sets and presentations while uh, locally you can export images, videos, panoramas, and presentations, right? So here we only have images and videos. That's why <clears throat> these are the only two options that are highlighted for us. And basically we're going to stack the things that we would like to export, right? So I'll click on image here. It shows me all of the different images that I have saved. So I'm going to click on, uh, for now, I'm just going to show you one, but basically for you you should click on all four i personally prefer to render out one image at a time just so that i can cancel it anytime i want right so we select it once you're done you just uh, click somewhere outside of of the one second i'm, I'm gonna once you once you're done you just click anywhere outside of the window and you're gonna see it right so we have image one format 
Uh, PNG um, gives you an image that does not have a background that with the background with alpha channel for the background, uh, which is sometimes useful. Uh, in our case, we will be using either JPEG or EXR. JPEG is um, the most lightweight image format, meaning that it's not going to be heavy. EXR is 16-bit, or sorry, it's 32-bit, meaning that it has a much wider range of brightness, uh, like in, in the highlights and in the shadows, and then you can control it much, much more in Photoshop later down the line, which we will do. So in this case, I will be using JPEG images simply because this is not a professional render and we will not be changing too many things in the in the render itself or sorry in Photoshop itself so I'm using Photoshop but just note that EXR is um, the professional go-to format right then under details we have the motion blur we have refinement and we have 3d mode refinement is basically how much stuff do the reflections see outside of your actual viewport so by default it's set to be off which is weird it should be at least low i will choose low um, and then if i will see that the reflections are bad then i will increase it to medium and re-render but for now i'm going to use low motion blur you always should have motion blur turned on or else it's not going to uh, look good well for static images maybe it doesn't matter as much but for videos motion blur matters because if the camera moves the, there should be blur right from the movement itself and 3d mode exports uh, like a three-dimensional image which we don't don't need that is used for you know vr stuff uh, stereoscopic 3d view so basically it exports two images one for left eye one for right eye we don't need that okay that those are the details right then I will add in my video. There we go. And here I can choose a format. Either export it as already a video file, MP4, or export it as series of still frames as PNG with frame rate set to either 30, 25, 60, or 120. This is how many frames per second. Cinematic is uh, 24. So I am going to actually change this to 20 four frames per second third uh, it's it's going to be a little bit more choppy but that is the cinematic look so we're going for it right um and i will be using mp4 usually i export it as png and then dress it up in either adobe premiere or davinci resolve but in this case i'm just going to use a mp4 format um then for video itself we have the motion blur turned on by default that's great which kind of no, it doesn't matter. Uh, motion blur is turned on. Perfect. Excellent. Video mode standard, not 3D, not 360, not 360 3D, just standard. And refinement, I really want this to be set to low at least. We'll see. We'll see. Um, with that being said, now when I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, these settings, I kind of want to go back and explain the image refinement settings as well. I believe this is just a guess because the documentation is not th that great, but this is just a guess. But for an image, image settings, the refinement, wherever it is, the refinement uh, only matters when you're using raster rendering, real-time rendering, rather than path traced rendering. Path traced. I don't think it cares about refinement at all. It just renders out the whole scene, even stuff that you don't see in the, in the viewport. Okay, with that done, we have one video and one image to render, and you just click on Start Export. Uh, one more thing, don't, don't forget before you start export, file, save, it's gonna crash if you don't. <laughs> so file, save, um, and then start export, uh, find your folder where you want to export it, select folder, and that's it. Now it's going to start computing. And I will stop recording really quickly because it's going to hit my graphics card very heavily. So my recording might even just die on its own. But basically here, if I go to task manager performance, I can show you how heavy the 
GPU is being hit. So I'm using um, RTX 3080 in graphics card. Um, the school computers in Lund University's computer lab uses RTX 3070, which is one uh, grade lower in graphics cards. And currently I am um, being hit at 7.2 out of 10 gigabytes, which is pretty decent. So we still have a little bit of breathing room uh, with memory usage at only 15 gigabytes, which is absolutely fine. And of course, the graphics card is doing the heavy lifting of rendering and it's pinned at like 95, 97%. With that said, one image and one animation is going to take one hour and 20 minutes to finish. So I will continue the video once that is done. All right, here we go. The renders are ready. I have made a few tests so that you don't have to. And the results are in. So let me just open up the first image here. This was done in uh, 512 samples per pixel, you no know, path tracer. And you can really see the noise here, right? If I zoom in, you know, the noise is very much apparent. So that was not enough. The image though took five minutes to complete, which is really fast, right? Then I made another one, this one. So previous, current, this one. This is at uh, 1024 pixels per, uh, sa samples per pixel, sorry. And that took eight minutes to complete. If I were to show you them side by side, give me a second, like that. And let's zoom into a appropriate size, 200%, uh, yeah, yeah, that's struggling here. 200% here. Please don't. Okay. <laughs> Great. You can see the difference, right? Between the two. So 1024 uh, samples per pixel, eight minutes. Next up, we have 2048 samples. Let me zoom in. Looks like that. Well, that's at 400%. Let's do 200. That's like that. And then last one is, and that took 15 minutes to do. And last one is 4,096 samples, which took 29 minutes to do. So we're reaching, you know, pretty um, long wait times. Still, 29 minutes is nowhere close to what you would get from V-Ray. Uh, V-Ray would take a few hours to render this one out. And if I zoom in, there's still a little bit of noise. So you might say, well, you should use a denoiser at this point. By the way, these are the fireflies that I was talking about, right? So you should use uh, denoiser to render, you know, an image like this out, but I like the noise. The noise looks cool here. If I go to the next image, this is rendered at 2048 samples. It uh, took also around 15 minutes to complete. And if I zoom into it, come on, see how messy it is? This is denoised. Let me zoom in. See how um, oily it looks? You lose all of the detail in there. If I, I can show you side by side because the next one is also 2048 samples. So it's still pretty noisy, right? But there's no denoising going on. And let me just, it's not going to be apples to apples comparison, but you'll get the idea. I'm, I'm gonna move to the point <laughs> pretty soon, but not just not yet. Okay, let's zoom in there. Like that. Come on. Struggling here a bit. Like that. Okay, that, that's good enough. Which one would you choose, right? More noise, but sharper details, less noise, and everything is just, you know, a blotchy, blotchy mess. Of course, you use the noise. The grayness is filmic as well cinematic as well. Last bit, okay, I already showed you this, but this area right here, uh, 2048, no uh, denoising since it was, um, it had a lot of sky in the scene. It only took six minutes to complete. So this one could be rendered out at 4,000 uh, samples per pixel. 
uh, quite easily. Last one, interior. 1024 samples denoised. I will be re-rendering this, to say the least. I will be for sure re-rendering this thing. Uh, you can see, especially on the glass, how kind of weird it gets and it gets all of these kind of foggy, foggy effects. I, I, I don't like it one bit. So we're going to be re-rendering this one. Okay, now on to the videos. First of all, when I try to export a, just a MP4 video, just doesn't, just doesn't work, just crashes, right? So I had to, I was forced to export uh, Lumen videos, right? Uh, sorry, not Lumen videos, but an image sequence, a PNG image sequence, remember? The different settings for, for the export for the videos, one second, add a video in there. Wow, messed that one up, plus video, great. And here we have MP4 or PNG, I chose PNG, right? So we ended up having, where is it? A set of images, right? Every frame is rendered out as a separate image. And then I had to use um, either DaVinci Resolve or uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, any one of the editing softwares, video editing softwares, DaVinci Resolve is free, by the way, uh, to just simply stitch the video to back together, you know, from separate image images and image sequence. And the result of it is, uh, where, where are we? There we go. Renders, image sequence, MP4. This is it. Three seconds for the first one, 10 seconds for the second one. You can clearly see that the foliage, let's go back here. Look at the foliage line, the cutoff threshold for the foliage. Let me move myself here. As, as we're playing, the foliage gets cut away, right? So that sucks. Uh, second thing is there's uh, some inconsistencies with how it reflects. There's some shimmering in the shadows and so on, right? It, it's a tough sequence for Lumen to render, first of all, because there's so much foliage in, in general, but it is it is kind of crapping the bed a little bit. So I felt bad for, you know, Lumen with this scene because uh, we, we were asking it too much. And I dug out another project that I have rendered. I have rendered it with Unreal Engine 5, but it was rendered with Lumen. And I just want to show you the, you know, the, the, the quality that you might expect if you are not pushing it too, too hard with translucent foliage and a lot of bounces and so on. So it's this one. It's still clearly lower quality than uh, path tracing, right? But this, for me, uh, would pass as something that I could show to the client and then say, you know, here, here's a here's a presentation of your um, of your house of the proposal. While the the one that we got from Tune Motion, that that was pushing it too far. If you would like to do that kind of animation, then you would need to do four thousand samples, path traced renders, probably denoised path traced renders because the noise would be annoying. Um, at that uh, level, and then you just simply wait a day, you know, for it to finish. Actually, we can do quick math. Uh, calculator, if one frame takes uh, around 25 minutes to complete, then 24 frames will take 600 minutes to complete. Uh, and then, so that's one second of animation. So let's say times, oops, times 10, 6,000 minutes. Uh, to complete 10 seconds of animation and divide that by, of course, by 60. We're at 100 hours. So that's that's a lot of hours. At that point, you do need to render it on multiple computers at the same time, right? If you have 10 computers, you're great. I mean, that, that's, that's fine. Then it's 10 hours, right? But 100 hours, that's way too much. All right. So that's where we're at with Lumen currently. There are clear limitations when it comes down to um, animation rendering. It is what it is. Now on to, oh, one more thing. 
So path tracing. The current implementation of path tracing is fine in Unreal Engine, oh sorry, in uh, Twin Motion, but Unreal Engine has it pushed even further, right? Especially with the assets and what kind of assets are used. So I just wanted to give you a quick uh, showcase of how much the realism is influenced by the use of certain high quality assets, right? So I have rendered out this particular scene as well in Unreal Engine from which uh, Twin Motion is built uh, from. It's, it's Unreal Engine is basically a video game engine and Twin Motion is a branch from it more tailored to architects. Easier to use, less, you know, but buttons to press, but at the same time, you know, less control from you. So if I open up this one, for instance, that's the path tracer in, in, in the Unreal Engine, right? Exactly same uh, parameters, same everything, except that much higher quality assets, as you can see from these leaves. And I can't really zoom in that much because I've rendered out a pretty small um, a pretty small image, but hey, this looks better, arguably, you know, and another version of this with a little bit higher uh, density meadow, right, covering the root base of the trees. So, of course, Unreal Engine version is much more convincing. Um, make sure to figure out how to get good assets. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the name of the game. Okay, now on to uh, actual Photoshop work. Right, and I'll just quickly show you how I treat the JPEG renders in Photoshop as well, before we move on to the next uh, chapter. So, for instance, looking at this, uh, the first thing that I hit it with is Control L to see uh, how does the distribution of bright versus dark pixels look like. And it seems like we have a little bit of breathe, breathing room for the bright pixels, you know. I can bring it in a bit more here and it's still not being burned out. With that being said, I'll, I won't do that. And also <clears throat> the hump is a little bit towards the left. So what happens if we bring this in? The whole image kind of brightens up and I don't really like that. So I'll actually going to bring it to the other side like so and I will force darker shadows in certain areas right so initially what uh, what I'm doing is by bringing the white portion of the levels and the dark portion of the levels together I'm increasing contrast right so we have that then if I were to wait is this the correct one seems a little bit noisy or yeah, that's because I'm zoomed in 200%, my bad. That's 100%, that's actually actually fine. Right, so that's the first thing. Second thing is I always check if, you know, there, there's some overpowering colors or anything like that. In this case, it seems to be quite okay, so I won't be um, changing anything too much. The yellow seems to be a little bit too much. But let's do one thing first and then we'll decide if the yellow is indeed too much. I go to adjustments and here we will find vibrance. And I'll just increase the vibrance ever so slightly to like 15 or so. This is before, this is after, before, after. Are you picking it up? Let's increase it to 100 so that you can see better. This is with vibrance, without, with without. You can see how much the roof is being hit, but uh, even without the roof, everything else, you know, it ramps up the vib vibrancy of the colors. You don't want it to be that intense, so instead we do 15, right, for vibrancy. Um, last one is under filter, uh, there should be sharpen. I kind of really want to do, one second, Noise, distort. I wonder if we should do a little bit of a blur. Uh, 0 0.5 pixels, maybe 0 0.3 pixels. Just to remove a little bit of sharpness from uh, the, this greenery right here, because it's a little bit plasticky. So I'm going to hit it with 0 0.4 maybe pixels of blur. 
this is before, like that. Let me zoom in even more to 200%. Redo. Undo. Redo. Actually, um, let's, let's undo and apply a slightly smaller Gaussian blur. 0.3. Something like that. Yeah, that, that's, that's much better. Okay, so that will look a little bit more natural, right? And with that, we are kind of done with this one. Everything else would be like slight corrections of, of color spectrum and so on, going into adjustments, hue saturation, finding the yellows, toning them down just a tiny bit, perhaps uh, shifting them a little bit towards green, plus three in hue, something like that. So before, after, you know, bringing it back to early autumn rather than late autumn or mid autumn. Um, yeah, let, let's let's leave it be, right? This image, same situation, control L, looking at the values. This portion right here is over dark. That's fine. We ignore it. We darken the rest. We let this become almost black. Darken, brighten up. That's a little bit too much, something like that. Then uh, the blues are too much. So I'm going to go for blues and reduce the saturation of them. Also cyan's, reduce saturation of those. That seems good. Uh, filter, same Gaussian blur as what we used before. Fine, um, could use a little bit more work, but it's okay. This one, same procedure. You can see how many bright pixels we have, but they're not burned out. So we're happy with it. Let me just bring that in. Try to darken this a bit. Okay, something like this. Uh, for sure, I mean, the colors, I kind of like the colors in this one, so I won't be uh, uh, hitting, hitting it with uh, any um, huge saturation. Uh, but I will be blurring it, Gaussian blur, a little bit more heavily, 0.5. Eh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 is too much, right? So this w is currently like that, it was before like that, right? Unifies it a little bit, okay, that's done. And this one, I won't even, I mean, this is gonna be re-rendered clearly, but we need to bring in the shadows. The light is fine. It should be darker, a bit darker. Actually, the shadows are, yeah, something like that. I'm just thinking if I should do anything else with it. Not really. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, very simple interior shot, right? So I will not be doing anything with this. We will be re-rendering this though, as I said, multiple times. Okay, and that's basically it. Then you just save your files uh, or save your images and you have yourself, the render is done. Hooray, hooray. Okay, don't uh, close <laughs> the, the video just yet. The bonus material is going to be very, very useful to get, you know, that extra small extra step in your in your process right i'm going to show you three different quite important things in the bonus chapter so well, i'll see you there all right let me show you three more tools or things that will help you enhance your image and bring it even further into realism hopefully close to 95, 99%. So first thing is called decals or decals. I'm not sure how to pronounce it properly, but if you go to library, to your library, you go to mega scans, here you have a full set of them. And in this case, I went for leakage, tileable, and I just downloaded a few of them and started dragging them in, right? So what these are is basically this transparent Think of graffiti or a tattoo, right? A stamp of things. Trans transparent entity that draws detail. I'm now unhiding them. 
draws detail on top of any surface, right? So here I have leakage, but I can also, if I go here and I just find metal, um, manhole cover, sure. That's gonna be weird, but let's just add in a manhole cover for the, on, on this wall, just so that we're on the same page of how it works, right? Basically, I am just adding in a two-dimensional image that has certain uh, bump map or certain normal map, so it appears as if it's 3, 3D, right? Um, and I can actually render this out, and you can see that it, it does look quite three-dimensional. Right now, it's it's blurred because it's uh, because uh, the, the, the camera is, is off, but that should work. Also, my I, I noticed that my recording is lagging. Hopefully, it's not going to crash. Please, please hold. <laughs> All right. So those are decals and decals. Still not sure. And they, of course, have properties and options. You can change the size of them. You can make them smaller or larger. You can uh, change the depth of them. So basically how far into the geometry do they reach out? I think this area is the best to show it. See here, as I'm changing the depth at a certain point, it stops hitting this wall, right? So you need to be very careful with where you, with how you place them and where you place them, right? Uh, then we have the opacity, so we can make them more intense or less intense. And sort order. Basically, if you have multiple decals on top of each other, uh, you can say which ones are first and which ones are next and so on, right? So sort order takes care of how are they layered, right? And of course, there's like all of the different settings for color, roughness, blah, blah, blah. We will not be uh, changing those because that's covered in the material portion of this this uh, course. Right, so that's the first thing. And if we were to check my render, I guess this one right here, you can see them appearing in this area in particular, you know, leaking through the concrete. Adding in that kind of a um, grime really helps you bring the objects to to life and you know sell the realism because nothing is perfectly clean in the real world speaking of which this is going to be a little bit of an extra thing but hopefully that's that's going to um, help you if i were to select for instance the roof Let, let's go for the roof you can already notice that the roof has a patina on it and if i were to pick that material you'll see that there is this grunge material, right? I already mentioned this grunge material, but that works really well in tandem with the decals for the dirt and the grime, right? Without grunge, the roof would be a little bit too synthetic, in my opinion. So the grunge just gives it a little bit that extra uh, breakage in the continuity of the surface, right? Sells the realism a bit better. Same thing for the glass. Uh, it's going to be tricky for me to show this to you because it only, most of the time, it only pops up in the, uh, what's, what's, what's the name, in the path tracer. But if I were to just find the reflective glass here, under, under, where, where was it? Give me a second. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Make this bigger so that you can also see imperfections there is the imperfections tab for for glass where you can enable imperfections and add fingerprints again they will not show up here but from certain angles uh, with path tracer they do show up and they do make make a difference so have that turned on as well so that is the first thing right the first note from me second thing is Actually, when you are framing things, I haven't shown you this during the course because I feel like it's uh, 
the real estate of the screen is a little bit cramped already and for this you kind of want to have two screens to work with right but if you have two screens it's very very convenient if we go to media I can just click on let's say this guy right here right and I can click on these three dots media menu and I can select media preview which will show me this particular wait what's that I haven't seen that before give me a second high quality Oh, okay, so, so you can uh, choose what kind of quality you want in terms of animating the trees and so on. Um, so you can lock in the view and you can quit media mode. Oh, sorry, not quit media mode. No, my, my bad, my bad. Go back into it. But you can now walk around, you know, with this camera or even jump to a different one, you know, and, and walk around there. And this view will stay the same. So when you're placing things and so on, it's quite useful uh, because then you can, for instance, you know, I need to reshuffle these bushes here, right? I can just move them around uh, conveniently on this screen. And here in this little, little screen, I can see uh, the bush also also move, you know. So it's, it's quite useful for, for kind of compositions. I don't really, again, I don't use it when I'm working on a single screen, but if, if, I'm, if I have two screens, then I use this quite, quite a bit. Okay, so that's that. To disable this, you just, oh, also one more thing, you can lock it, right? You can lock it and now, you know, it, it becomes an, a, a video, not video, sorry, a window that you can drag into your, your second screen. That, that's what I meant, right? So now if I'm moving around, this is still there. Okay, let's quit media mode. So that's uh, thing number two. Thing number three. All right, this is going to be a little bit more intense, but bear with me. It's, it's going to be worth it, I promise. If I go and, and check out this, okay, let's log that in and let's actually get out of the media preview mode. I have added uh, this lady right here on, on the sofa, right? For, for the render purposes, right? For a person character. And the issue with the render that I get from here is that's the wrong one renders pop, pop. doesn't look natural looks very three-dimensional uh, you know a 3d model on canny valley but we can fix that now in the age of wait i needed to do this in the age of ai we can fix this so I have this render right here with the character placed on the bed, right? Or sofa, sorry, on the sofa. This is, by the way, how we had it previous, all very soapy and a little bit more noisy, but much, much more detail. We have this character, right? I will zoom into this character and I'll use Windows key Shift S. I'll just drag around this lady right here, like so. What I did was make a print screen, a partial print screen, print screen, Windows key, Shift S, and then drag a rectangle around, right? Then, then I go to crea.ai and I register. I create a free account, all right? Then we go to enhance and I control V my uh, print screen. And you need to wait for it for a while because what Crea.ai will do, Crea AI will do, it's going to, uh, let's click on the settings here. It basically writes a prompt of what is going on with the with the image 
A woman sits on a couch in a room with a coffee table and multiple vases. vases. Well, it reads these as vases. We don't care. We care about it recognizing that it's a woman. This is a woman and that the woman is sitting on a couch, right? So it's not going to um, go too far off script, so to say. And then you don't really need to change anything here. You just enhance. Click on enhance. Now we need to wait a little bit. It, it does take a few minutes to calculate, but as long as you're upscaling only 2x, two times, um, it's not going to take too long. Also, it is going to be free to do. While it's doing it, we can go back in here into um, in, in, into Photoshop and start preparing uh, for you know, ingestion of the upscaled image. So here what I have is, is the original uh, render, as you can see. And I haven't changed anything about it. And I will not be changing any anything because that's the render from which we are generating the upscaled portion of it, of upscaled window of it, right? Uh, let me just double check if it's done already. Yeah, there, there we go, it's done. And now, okay, magic. So this is the upload that we had. Right, so AI is going to be quite useful in the future. It is quite useful right now. So we can take this image, this partial image, and don't do it for the whole, uh, I know what you're thinking, don't do it for the whole image. You will lose control um, over the style of it. Don't do it for the whole thing. Do it for the characters, do it for certain details, right? Here in the bottom, we click on, oh, you don't see it, zip, here in the bottom, we click on download and it just fetches it to your downloads folder. I'll open it up, I have this enhanced image three, right? And I will just add it in to my Photoshop file, right? Now you need to de uh, decrease the opacity. I should move myself here. Uh, you decrease the opacity of this new layer, uh, 50, 60%, something like that. Drag it to approximately fit in terms of the size. And now align anything that you feel might, might, might align. So I'm gonna go for maybe the eyes. Mm, less, oops, less opacity, there we go, even less opacity, just trying my best, okay, so that, okay, the cheek this this area i've aligned this area right and i can see that the shoes don't don't really match that well that's fine control t to transform and drag the middle this little middle icon if you don't see it by the way make sure that uh, i think this is ticked yeah that this uh, tick mark is ticked here top left top left and just drag this little icon to the area that you have aligned in this case, it's gonna be the cheek right here. And from it, start scaling, right? So, so you don't scale with your mouse anymore, you're scaling with percentage, and that little thing that you dra dragged is going to be the center of your scaling, right? So it's aligning. So now you just need to find a percentage that aligns. So 41, uh, that's too small, 42, 41 and a half. <laughs> Perfect fit. 41 and a half. Okay, enter, enter. Now we have a perfectly aligned, let's go 100%, a perfectly aligned AI version of this. 
of course you will see that you know um, it has enhanced other things as well and we don't we kind of don't don't like that it did that um, so we will need to delete a few things uh, just get an eraser tool that's not an eraser tool where is that there there it is there, get the eraser tool make it soft as soft as possible hardness zero size make it as big as possible uh, the smart object must be rasterized but, uh, yes rasterize the smart object and just erase do, 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 do. everything that you don't need basically we're eliminating the seam between the ai enhanced image and the character uh, sorry and the environment here and that is almost we're we're almost there right we're almost there let's take a look at this get rid of that don't need that don't need that get rid of that yep something like this good now we have a little bit of a problem and the problem is called this is way too high quality compared to the rest of the image so it just sticks out like a sore thumb right if you have something like this, then I would argue that this is better because it's um, th this blends in much better with the environment. So we need to do a, a few extra extra things. Whoops. Uh, the extra thing is called filter, blur, Gaussian blur, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 pixels, something like that. I am going to use 0 0.4 pixels. Reduce the sharpness. Second, filter, noise, add noise. You need to match the noise. 3% Gaussian monochromatic. Okay. Right? Now it's much better. You know, it's, it's connecting much better. But still, the amount of detail that you have here is too much. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit the highest frequency uh, areas with a eraser tool and get rid of some of the highlights. And for instance, the shoes, they can not be that glossy. This part, you know, less. I'm, I'm just, by the way, I'm, I'm just deleting stuff from here you know jacket something like that because the realism doesn't come from the jacket and so on it comes from how does the light touch the leg right for instance see how this is you know it's not good that this is bad better much much better those are the details that we're trying to keep of course the, the head the, the face clearly you know that that that's important but um mostly it's uh, you know the, how does the light touch the skin and how does it interact with the skin that's very hard for twin motion to replicate so we're using ai for that with that done mm, that's a little bit Sorry, I'm just going to do a quick little, there we go, that. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. We have ourselves, uh, it, it could blend in a little bit better, but uh, that, that, that's good enough. We have ourselves a character that is outside of Uncanny Valley, you know, when, when it comes down to renders and, and realism. Um, before after before after right so that is my suggestion or bonus material number three with this we are done wait, wait i need a better picture i like this one the most I just whatever with this we are done with this course I hope you've enjoyed it I hope you liked it I'll see you in the next one <laughs> bye